Today's episode is sponsored by Best Fiends. Head on over to the App Store or Google Play to pick up the mobile game sensation with 100 million downloads. And we'll be discussing the game more in depth later in the show. Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well. This week's episode highlights seven of the scariest stories you can find on the web. Don't believe me? I guess we'll have to put it to the test. Let us begin as we journey further into Mr. Creep's mind. Something hides in San Francisco when the fog comes in. Written by Luminox. There is something hiding in San Francisco, and it comes out when the fog comes in. It hunts us. It torments us. And I was unfortunate enough to finally meet it. A few days ago, I was making my way through the city hoping to reach my house before the fog rolled in and it got dark out. Earlier that day, our local weather station had issued a severe fog warning for 6pm all the way to 12 a.m. the next morning. It was 5.15, and I still had a good distance to walk before I arrived at my house safe and sound. I had been making decent progress when the already cold temperature dropped even further. The dim light had faded and the sky became abysmal and dark. The fog had made it, as thick and as dense as expected, but far earlier, roughly half an hour. Not only that, but the sun seemed to disappear below the horizon far faster than normal, even for this time of year. I had walked for a few more minutes when the city seemed to die. All lights flickered off, the air grew colder still, and the few cars and people that had been out seemed to vanish, only with a silence and fog remaining with me. With little to no visibility left, I found a familiar sign in the mist. Bayview Estates, my neighborhood. Only a few more minutes and I would be home safe and sound. It was when I was approaching my house I heard a noise. I froze instantly in terror, my heart and muscles shutting down completely from the horror I had just witnessed. A haunting moan echoed through the once silent void around me, the kind of noise that is nothing but raw agony and misery. The kind of noise that no person or being on this earth should be capable of making. It was a sound of pure sadness and despair. Then again, but different. Louder, closer. Then again, but not as sad, but mad. And louder still. I turned around and peered down the street in a desperate attempt to locate the source of the noise. At first, I was only met with the deep fog. But as I looked closer, I noticed a tall and slender figure. At first, it looked to be a lamppost, but lampposts don't sway in the wind or move at all. The creature took another step in my direction. Whether it noticed me or not, I was unsure, but I was frozen in absolute terror. It moaned again, a dreadful melody consumed with pain and rage. It moved closer to me, and I was able to make out its form in slightly more detail. The thing was massive, looking to be about 10 feet tall, with a skin gray and red in color, with no features whatsoever, all over the body from what I could see. My eyes moved up to its face, long and thin. It was gray in color with red in some places like the rest of the body. No hair or ears or nose or eyes, but it did have a mouth. A massive, grotesque, unnatural smile was plastered across its face, spanning from what would have been ear to ear, with blood and other odd substances dripping and running down its face, falling to the ground, leaving a small trail of vile liquids in its wake. What the heck? The thing could not have been conjured up by my worst nightmares and thoughts. The kind of thing that, not even in the deepest depths of hell, would accept is okay. This was something else. Something awful. It moaned again, 15 feet from me now. 
When it moaned, its mouth did not move, not at all. It just stayed fixed in that appalling smile. After it moaned, I could hear other sounds. Something heavy and solid being dragged along the ground at its side. And it took me a moment to process what it was, until I looked at the form. A mutilated form hard to recognize, but there was one thing that made it clear to me. A tattered, blue piece of fabric that was wrapped around the center of the object, with spots of what looked like blood, probably from the creature's mouth. And then it hit me. That blue, that fabric. It looked exactly like the kind of thing my... The creature's head snapped suddenly in my direction, bones and joints snapping and cracking with a sickening clarity. It was looking at me now, and I was looking at it. I couldn't see its eyes, but I knew it was looking at me. I could feel it looking at me, staring into the depths of my soul, seeing into my mind, twisting it, manipulating it. I felt sick, lost, fearful, worried, and so much more. It made a noise again, something that I can only describe as a violent and muffled scream, starting low and getting louder. It took one more step in my direction, and that was my cue to spin on my heels and run as quickly as I could. I just wanted to get to my house where I could hide it until the fog had moved on, and hopefully that thing will leave with it. I ran for quite some time. My legs are driving me forward in long, powerful strides. I didn't hear anything behind me as I ran. Not these screams and cries of anguish and pain. Nor thunderous footfalls I would expect that thing to make. Just the frigid wind howling through my ears. I arrived at the two-story work of art that was my home. A place that should be safe. Should have been safe. I opened the door gently turning the knob with my cold and dry hands. I stepped in, the lights off, everything quiet except for my labored breathing. My health is not all that good, so that kind of thing would really wear me down. I was sure to lock the door behind me, even turning my extra locks to be sure nothing unwanted would enter. I removed my warmer clothing and then fought along the wall for the light switch, and in turn some comfort. The bright warmth filled the house as, one by one, the lights flashed on. Still shaken from what I had encountered moments before, I walked into the living room, turned on the radio for some music while I made some food. The radio crackled to life and a happy little song started to flow through the air around me, Call me me, and with it, I began to cook. I was in the middle of taking my chicken out of the oven when... The music abruptly stopped, and was replaced by a static and automatic sounding voice. The National Weather Service has issued a severe fog warning for the entire Bay Area, and all locations around the immediate San Francisco area. Conditions have deteriorated to a point where it is no longer safe to be driving or walking outside. Most importantly, lock your doors, close your windows, turn off your lights, don't look or go outside. Have a good rest of your evening, San Francisco. And the voice cut out and the original song returned. What? I looked outside and onto the completely obscured street. Yeah, that's fair, I guess. I couldn't even see the plants in my front garden clearly. But there was one thing about that announcement that really freaked me out. Lock your doors, close your windows, turn off your lights. Don't look or go outside. What the heck does that even have to do with the fog warning? I looked out front again, and I thought of that creature that I had seen in the fog. What if, what if that warning was based on the thing that I just saw now? But why would they warn us not to go outside? We don't even know what it does. We don't even know if it's dangerous. And then I remembered what had been by its side. I immediately leaned over the sink to throw up my lunch. That creature... It had been dragging the mangled and mutilated corpse of one of my neighbors a few doors down, with blood dripping from its mouth and onto the ground below. Oh god, no. Please, no. I quickly walked to my front door and latched every lock I could get my hands on. I locked my windows, 
and closed the curtains with one swift motion, almost ripping them clean off the wall. I stumbled down the stairs to the basement and hid in the guest bedroom. I brought my radio for updates, my dog for company, some food, a few books, some flashlights, and extra batteries, along with other forms of basic necessities for survival. It was a nice enough room, with a decent sized bed, a bathroom to the side, a small window, and plenty of room to move around. Some friends and family had stayed down there before, but that was a long time ago, so it was relatively clean. I set all of my things down in the corner, closed and locked the window, turned on a lamp, and I began a new book. About 30 minutes of reading later, another announcement came on the radio, startling me as I had not been expecting it. This is just a reminder that conditions outside have not improved, and are unlikely until the next day. Have a good night, San Francisco. And remember, lock your doors, close your windows. Don't go outside and don't answer the door, no matter what you hear or see. May cut out again, returning to the easy listening station I had said it to earlier. God, could I just relax for one minute? There was something new in that announcement though, and it only added to my heightening dread. Don't answer the door, no matter what you hear or see. To hear that kind of thing on the radio is just downright terrifying. I turned it off to listen carefully for anything at all. I didn't hear anything, just my dog breathing heavily as she lay on the floor beside me. I was on high alert now. I had no clue what might have been going on outside, but there was no way in this life or the next that I would be going to go and find out. I decided to turn back on the radio, quieter this time but at least I could drown out whatever might be outside. Seeing as I was tired from the long day that I had, I chose to give myself a break after a while for some rest. I woke up the next morning to another announcement, similar to before. Good morning, San Francisco. I hope you all had a good night and followed the rules put in place. All the same remain in effect for today. The fog is not yet lifted, and it is still too dangerous to go outside. We advise all citizens to stay in their homes until further notice. And of course, they ended with the same line. I went through the rest of the day without doing much, eating when I felt hungry, taking a shower around lunchtime to clean up, just anything really to keep myself occupied, and my mind entertained and not wandering. It was later towards 6 p.m., sunset for this time of the year, I was running low on food, so I wanted to grab a few more things from upstairs to make it a little more cozy down here, as it seemed I might be spending anywhere from another day to another week hiding. I slowly unlatched the bedroom door and tiptoed down the hallway, and up the flight of stairs to the first floor. I was met by nothing new, all of the curtains and windows still shut. My dinner from two nights ago was still on the table gone cold. I walked into the kitchen, grabbed a bag, and started to pile food into it. I also took a few more batteries and a phone charger. I picked up a few blankets and was about to bring all of my new supplies downstairs when I heard something. A light sound, almost visible, but I definitely heard it. Tapping. It was really quiet, almost like it was my imagination playing with me, but it was real. I looked around, my heart pounding, but I just couldn't pinpoint where it was coming from. It got louder, increasing in volume ever so slightly, and even with it being crystal clear after a minute or two, I still couldn't figure out where it was coming from. It couldn't be in the house, right? It continued to escalate in volume, getting louder and louder until it hurt my ears and still. It sounded like it was coming from all around the house. My curiosity got the best of me, and I deeply regretted it. I should have just taken my things and went back downstairs to wait out, but no, I didn't. I slowly edged in the direction of my window. I lightly grasped the curtains and pulled them back ever so slightly. They fell away and off to the side, 
leading me to stare into the void. The tapping immediately stopped. I stood there. Maybe I really had imagined it. I pressed my face closer to the window, looking for any sign of the mist lifting. As I did, the fog straight ahead of me began to darken, and slowly an object moved close enough so I could make out what it was. With only an inch of glass separating us, there it was. The same cold gray featured this face that I had seen only one day ago, except this time, its face it really was featureless. And then it started to split at the bottom half, and a smile began to form, stretching unnaturally wide, spanning the entire length of its face, showing its blooded and gnarly teeth. It was back. It was that thing, and it knows that I'm in here now. I panicked, tripping and falling backwards. I watched it fade into darkness once more. I jumped to my feet and I scrambled to the stairs, practically throwing myself down. Everything in my arms. I ran to the guest bedroom and slammed the door shut behind me, grabbed any furniture I did not need, and pressed it against it to form a barricade. No, I had done it. I had broken the one rule that had been said so many times that I knew it by heart now. Lock your doors, close your windows, turn off your lights. Don't look or go outside, and don't answer the door, no matter what you hear or see. I felt so stupid. I had literally seen that thing. That's what the warning was for, not the fog, but for that creature. The creature that knows I'm in here. The radio fell silent, and my dog became quiet too. Something she rarely does. I joined her, listening to every single sound I could hear through my pounding heart. Clicking, not the same as before, but like opening something with a lock on it. It's opening my door. I could hear it struggling with one of the locks. I had had at least ten done up right now, so I might have some time to live. I huddled up behind the bed frame under a blanket. I heard something metal clatter to the floor. It got through the first one, but then another fell and another and another, and then one more fell, and I heard the door slowly creak open and gently bump into the wall as it swung open. I was shaking with fear, sobbing silently in my awful hiding spot. I did this to myself. I knew it was my fault. And I knew that I would never get to see anyone I loved or do anything fun ever again. I wasn't going to die peacefully in my bed. I was going to get mauled to death by the monster that was now in my house. I heard the shuffling of feet, fast, swift movements. They got louder and closer, but then it was silent. I had no clue how close it was. My door flew open, all the furniture flying through the air like it was nothing crash into the floor, leaving me covered in debris. I was bleeding bad, and my chest was being crushed by a wooden beam. This was it. I could hear bones cracking and snapping, my dog crying out and then falling silent. And then I heard it breathe, a strained, mangled inhale, and a similar grotesque exhale. I suddenly felt a massive hand wrap around my arm, my bones are breaking and shattering, piercing my skin like a thousand razor-sharp needles. I screamed. The blanket fell to the floor and I was face to face with this creature. And everything went dark. The last thing I saw was its sinister smile, widening further. My smile now, along with all of those who have died like me, I walk the streets of San Francisco when the fog rolls in, taking lives the way mine was. Don't come looking for me. Don't try to save me. I'm already dead. Don't come here. Stay far away from the Bay Area. It's for your own good. Because something hides in San Francisco when the fog rolls in. Support for Creepscast is brought to you by Best Fiends, the free-to-download mobile game that has captured the interest of millions. Now, I'll be honest with you guys, I've got a pretty busy schedule, so 
and it's been tough for me to be able to sit down and enjoy games like I used to. The other day, I was looking for a game that I could play on the go, without sacrificing the challenge or excitement of the titles I remember enjoying when I had all the time in the world. I tried a few out before I stumbled upon Best Fiends, a mobile puzzle game with 100 million downloads. And honestly, I'm sort of obsessed with it. Best Fiends has a ton to offer and it is much more than your average puzzle game. This thing has me hooked and I'm enjoying every second of it. There are thousands of fun puzzles to solve and they keep the content coming with fresh challenges every day. Not to mention, the game hosts a large variety of collectible characters that feel satisfying to unlock. If you're anything like me, you may have found mobile games unsuccessful in holding your attention in the past. I completely understand that sentiment, but I would implore you to give Best Fiends a try. It's free to download, so there's no harm in trying it out, and I don't think you'll regret it for a second. Download the 5 star rated puzzle game, Best Fiends, free today in the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. I worked as an overnight security guard at a college. What I saw made me quit. Written by Objective Tell 6047. I had just gone through a pretty rough divorce a few months ago. For the brief two years my ex and I were married, most of our nights ended up turning into shouty matches and insults. We were always so loud that we had gotten several noise complaints and an eventual ultimatum that we could be thrown out of the building. Anyway, we ended the whole thing, and she got the most of everything. The house belonged to her family along with almost everything in it. She let me only have my clothes, some photos, and my dog, Riley. I was short on money at the time. Luckily, a friend of mine let me stay in his home for as long as I needed. While there, I was looking for a better paying job to help me get my life back on track. My search led me to an opening for a campus security guard at the local community college. I arrived at the interview to learn that this was a job for the night shift. I wasn't too sure about taking the job at first, but my bills and growing debts weren't going to pay off themselves. Needless to say, I started the next night. The campus itself was a decent size, both in terms of area and the number of students. The core campus includes 14 educational and auxiliary buildings, the security office was by the south entrance of the college, situated on the second floor of the parking garage. The two senior security guards, James and Darnell, walked me through my job description. My task every night was to complete two full searches around campus, checking all the buildings and monitoring the security cameras. My shift would start at 9.30 at night and go through 6 o'clock in the morning by which time I would take the bus home. The job itself wasn't too bad. I kind of developed a friendship between James and Darnell, since there was a brief period of time that our shifts would overlap. By the time they both left, it would be midnight for me and I would be alone on campus. It's so surreal how such a place that's bustling and full of students can quickly empty out and turn silent. When my shift starts, there's usually a few cars left in the lot for those who took evening classes. Some instructors and other staff would sometimes work extra late, but those instances were rare. In short, my interaction with other people besides my coworkers was almost non-existent. Sometimes on break or in between circuits, if I stayed quiet on campus, I would read a book or listen to spooky stories on my phone. After listening, I would start to feel a little creeped out for being in a campus all alone after dark, but I got used to it. It killed the boredom until I started my next circuit. I wouldn't find much of anything out of the ordinary, aside from the random object left behind by a student, which I would bring back to the lost and found. I just had to make sure that no one else was hanging around after closing. 
After coming back, I would check the security footage in case I had missed something. There were a few screens recording specific spots with the most activity during the day. One for each parking lot, one for each floor and all the buildings, and one for the administrative office. I got decent pay every couple of weeks. After a while, I moved out of my friend's house and got a small apartment and I was saving up for a used car. I felt like my luck was starting to turn around finally. And then, I had the scariest experience of my life. I was left alone around midnight like always. The campus was absolutely deserted at this time like normal. It was summer during this time so the night was pretty warm. I felt like I was building a bit of a sweat in my security uniform while doing my first circuit. I came back to the security office. After finding nothing of note and checked the camera feed, I found nothing in any of the screens until I checked the one for the south parking lot near the office. While the screen was small, I could discern the moving of a large shadow across one of the lampposts. It was doing nothing but moving back and forth across the light. The shadow looked too large to be some small bird or animal. I deduced it had to be someone parked off screen so I could invisibly see them. I went out there to check things out and I found nothing. If they were a person just messing around, they would have left a sign of their presence. But there was nothing left behind. I didn't hear a car driving off, or any noise for that matter. I scoped the rest of the south lot to find the source of the shadow. Still nothing. I sighed in annoyance at the thought of some idiot deciding to waste my time. Nothing else happened for the rest of the night. I got used to sleeping during the day, but all I could afford to sleep on was a cheap couch that was anything but comfortable. It was rare that I got a full 8 hours of sleep on it, and to top it off, the AC unit had crapped out. My cheap apartment had gotten warmer, making it much harder to sleep. I got to the college at the start of my shift with maybe 4 or 5 and a half hours of sleep. I had coffee, but the energy it gave me only lasted for so long. With it being extremely late, and my office feeling cool and being quiet everywhere, I started feeling drowsy. Sleeping on the job wasn't allowed, of course, but every now and then I let myself have a brief nap to refresh myself. So, I set my head on my desk and I fell asleep instantly. I was later jolted awake. A feeling of something very wrong switched my tired mind on alert and woke me up. I rubbed my eyes and checked the monitors to see if anything was up. I looked at the camera feed for the south lot, and my eyes narrowed. Beneath one of the lamplights, a person was standing, not doing anything but just being very still. I couldn't make out any details, but this person had a long black hair, and looked very tall for almost reaching the light. I looked at the bottom of the screen and found the camera was still recording. Whoever the camera was showing was still there. The feeling that jolted me awake intensified, and I was aware of myself shaking. A chill, colder than the air inside the office, had crept up my neck. My body was reacting to some sort of danger the image was giving off. Still, a weird person on the security footage was not an excuse to not do my job. I got to the lot in under a minute, and saw that person still standing under the lamplight, just being dead still. Their back was facing toward me, and their head seemed to be bowed forward. As I approached closer and tried to get their attention, I found that this trespasser was very tall and lanky, and was wearing a dirty white dress. I called to her again, asking if she needed help, but I didn't respond. She just kept standing like a statue where she was. I reached out to touch her and my hand retracted back from the burning sensation her skin gave off, as if she were on fire. I cursed and shook my hand to cool it off, and the lady moved for the first time. Her head lifted upward, as if finally acknowledging I was there. She turned around and I started to track backwards. 
Her body was humanoid, but she had the head of a goat or a ram. The fur was a pitch black, contrasting against her pale skin and white dress. The eyes were red like burning embers and strands of flesh hung off its curved horns. As I backwards walked and sped up, I could hear it give off a deep, thunderous roar. I ran back towards the office, and I swear that I could hear the thing sprinting after me. I ran faster than I ever have in my life, and I barricaded myself in the security office. For good measure, I switched off the lights inside and called 911. I told them that something was on campus and they sent someone over here. I hung up and strained my ears to hear any noise outside of my office. It was hard to notice anything other than the pounding of my heart working overtime. It felt like an eternity before I heard the knocking at the door. The cops notified their presence and I slowly opened the door. They questioned me about what I had called for. When I told them, they looked at me as if I were a mental patient or something. I played the footage back to them, and there the thing was. At the very least, they weren't going to arrest me for making a fake emergency call. But with the trespasser gone, there wasn't much that they could do. They left, and I was once again all alone. By now, I was very afraid. Not that I was alone, but afraid that I wasn't alone, and that that thing was still out there. I wasn't going to take any chances. I waited in that office and kept the door locked until the end of my shaft. I left a note saying that I resigned immediately, and I never went back. When I was four years old, my parents moved to a rural small town in the West Virginia outback. This was because Charleston was too noisy and too expensive for them. They wanted the quiet and privacy of the wooded town. I'm not going to say the name of the town on here, so you don't go there and bother the people who live there. Our new house was a two-story house with four bedrooms. Two of the bedrooms were going to be converted into an office and a playroom. My parents both worked at home, so an office space for them was going to be very useful, and the playroom was for me to have all my toys and not bother to clean them up when I was done. I loved our house. There was nothing wrong with the house, and in fact, it was the only place where I felt safe in that town. I started going to school at the normal age, and there weren't many other people, so making friends was easy. And by the time that I was in 6th grade, I was friends with pretty much everybody at school. I started to dislike the town around the age of 12. Anytime that I would walk to the bus stop in the morning, something always felt off. Sometimes the air was unnaturally still, despite the lack of an approaching storm. Sometimes the usual bird songs wouldn't be present. Nothing ever felt quite right. I would usually wake up for school at around 6am, just so that I could take a shower, and then play on my DS before I had to go to school. My bus would arrive at around 8.15, so I liked that extra time to myself. One day, however, I lost track of time and realized that I had missed the bus. And school started at 9, so no big deal. It wouldn't take me all too long to walk there. It was only about a mile away. When I left the house that day, I once again felt the unease that I usually would whenever waiting for the bus in the morning. I brushed it off and began to walk. I distinctively remember it being silent and still that day. Although the town was tiny, you would usually see people driving at the time in the morning, but the roads were empty, not even any other kids walking to school. The walk felt like it took an eternity. I felt like something had been watching me that day, even when I was in school. I decided to sit away from the windows that day, but that didn't help me shake the feeling though. After school, when I was waiting outside for my bus to arrive, I knew that something was watching me, that it wasn't just a feeling anymore. It's like my mind was screaming at me to run, that whatever it was, it was getting closer. 
and just then I saw it. As one of the buses passed, I saw something that definitely wasn't human on the bus. Its skin was pitch black, it had white dots as eyes, and it watched me through the back window as the bus drove off. I was paralyzed with fear. I was snapped back into reality when my bus driver hollered at me to get on. That night, I couldn't sleep. I could only think about what I saw on the bus. In the morning, I decided to tell my parents that I felt sick and I didn't want to go to school. They gave me a look like they knew that I was lying, but they let me stay home anyway since I had all A's. All day, all I could think about was that thing. However, I didn't see it again until a few years later. It was late December, and the last day of school before the Christmas break, and in all my classes, we just watched movies. I sat near a window and I looked out at the falling snow, and I saw it. About ten feet away from the window, staring at me. All of a sudden, I remembered what I had seen a couple of years ago. I don't know how long I stared, but after what seemed like an eternity, it turned and walked away in the snow. I got a better look at it this time. Its arms were nearly to the ground, and its legs were always bent. It had a very noticeable slouch, and it was, I guess, seven to eight feet tall. I was terrified when I got home that day. My mind raced with questions. What was it, and why was it following me? When I walked through the doors that day, my mom immediately hugged me and made sure that I was okay. I was extremely confused, and when I asked what was going on, they showed me what was being talked about on the local news. A 13-year-old kid had just been found dead on a small road in the town. He had been mauled by something. Although they didn't show any pictures for obvious reasons, police were saying that it was most likely a bear attack. When I heard this, my stomach sank. I immediately jumped to the thought that it was whatever had been watching me that day. My mom must have seen my pale face because she reassured me that everything was fine and that the police would deal with it properly. I wanted to believe her, but I just couldn't. How were the police going to catch that monster? And if I even went so far as to tell the police what I saw, would they believe me? I went up to my room and turned on Cartoon Network to try and calm myself down, but it didn't work. I eventually panicked myself to sleep. I woke up in the middle of the night and Adult Swim was playing American Dad reruns. I decided to get some water from the kitchen. As I descended the stairs, I looked out the back porch window at the bottom of the stairs. And right there, staring into the window, was the monster. I instinctively ducked back up the stairs and peeked out to see if it had noticed me. It didn't seem like it did because it was scanning back and forth as if looking for me. My dad had a gun in his room, so being the stupid kid I was, I thought the best idea was to shoot it with said gun. I snuck into my parents' room and found the hiding spot for the pistol. I made sure that it was loaded, which it was, and I crapped back down the stairs. I peeked out the towards the back door again, and it was gone. I slowly made my way into the kitchen, and I hid under the table, looking through all the windows to see if I could see it. Just then, I heard the front door open. My saw it slowly shamble as the door swung open. It walked around. I assumed it was looking for me. It walked up the stairs and I heard my parents' door opening. My hands trembling as I slowly got out from under the table. I made my way over to the stairs. My parents' door was wide open. I saw the black against the dark blue in there, and I knew that was it. I pointed the gun up the stairs and pulled the trigger. Nothing happened because the safety was on. All that I accomplished was that it noticed me. I saw it turn towards me, the white dots piercing into me. I fumbled with the gun, trying to turn the safety off. When I got it off, I looked back up and the door was closed. It took me an eternity to work up the courage to go up the stairs and open the door. 
and when I did, it was gone. I nearly collapsed when I saw what it had done to my parents. I'll spare the details here because they still haunt me to this day. In short, it looked a lot like a bear attack, so if you want a good idea of what their corpse is like, just google it. I was only 16 at the time and I had no job. I didn't want to be put in foster care and then become homeless, but I had no other choice than to call the police. When they arrived, they asked me questions because they found me clutching a gun in my parents' room. They ruled me out as a suspect, and like I guessed, they sent me to the foster care system. Luckily, I was adopted by people who only wanted older kids so they could give them a nice home. That was only four years ago, so the memories are still fresh in my head. I live in South Carolina now because my new family wanted to move me away from the place that was giving so many bad memories. I can't ever thank them enough for taking me in. Since that day, I haven't seen the thing since. I hope that by this point, someone was able to kill it. If not, well, we all know the answer to that. I saw screaming faces in the storm. Written by Postmortem33. I moved into a very isolated cabin somewhere in the woods. I just wanted to be away from the city, from all its monotony that made me lose interest in everything that place had to offer. Switching places from a beat-up, one-bedroom apartment to a small cabin in the woods seemed to be everything that I'd ever wished for. The clean, fresh air that slowly crept up in my room every morning and when I would open the windows made me think that it was the right choice. The chirping of crickets at night and the sound that the ice cubes made when I drank some good old whiskey were music to my ears. One cigar from now and then always helped me to better focus in the silent evenings. The woods were located at the edge of a very small rural town with a population of approximately 300 people. I was going there maybe once a week for groceries at first. That way, I slowly got to know almost every person who lived there. One day, I got to meet a man by the name of James Greenwood. Word in town added that he was the former CEO of a multi-million real estate company. When his business went bankrupt a few years back, James fell off the wagon and into a never-ending spiral of accumulating debt through gambling and wasting money away on alcohol. He ended up going insane too. He always talked to gibberish that no one seemed to ever understand. He lived from the mercy of the community. Everyone always contributed to his well-being, and they helped him in every way that they could. Money, food, and a room to stay for free at the local inn. I wanted to do the same after a few weeks of constantly seeing him at the bar. He always paid back the people who would help him by doing chores for them. So, I wanted to pay him to bring my weekly groceries to the cabin. That way, I could have been even more isolated without having to go in town weekly. James was always sober during the day. After he would finish doing all his work, he would head at the inn, get smashed in under an hour, and then hit the hay. The rather odd thing is that the people in town always talked nicely and they were polite. But it was just that. I never felt a strong connection to any of them. I tried talking more to some, but they always ended the talk abruptly. And the best conversations that I had were with James. Sometimes, he would stay for a few minutes more after bringing me the groceries. One day, I found a note from him inside of one of the bags. It read, Sir, these people are not what they seem. The entire town is cursed. There's something terrible coming tonight. A storm. If what's inside it comes out, it's already too late. You need to leave immediately. Uh, James, James, lay off the booze, man. I remember telling myself while pouring a glass of whiskey. I thought it was ironic and funny at the same time. Or maybe not so funny. 
Another odd thing that I realized after reading that note was that there weren't any communication means to the outside world. I never saw anyone with a laptop, a cell phone, a tablet, or any smart device. Also, I never even saw a TV at the inn or the local market. All these people lived in a self-made bubble inside that small town. These things started to feel very wrong all of a sudden. I couldn't wrap my head around it. Okay, yeah, I wanted to be isolated, but I didn't want to live like a caveman, you know. I didn't want to be away from the rest of civilization and not know what was happening around me. That same evening, all hell broke loose. I remember the sky going dark all of a sudden. Black clouds were gathering at an enormous speed. They morphed and changed in size and just settled above the small town. I got back inside of the cabin thinking it was going to be a very bad storm. I made sure all the windows were securely shut. The obvious question came to mind. How did James know about the coming storm? There wasn't any way to know about it. I found out I only had phone reception if I stayed still near the kitchen window. It was very unpredictable though. So I took it out of my pocket and I saw it had one bar. I immediately typed in the name of the town and the weather forecast. It said that indeed there was a storm coming. So how did James know about it? That was my burning question. At that exact moment, a sense of unease crept up my spine. This wasn't a normal thing. The way those clouds moved high up in the sky made me cringe. Their dark shapes looked like they were an apostle for the end of the world. The hair in my arm suddenly rose and dread was slowly building up inside the house. The wind started howling. Its shrieks of pain floated in the air and smashed into the outside walls. There was a loud banging on my front door, and it kept on repeating. Someone or something was on the other side, smashing fists against the wooden door. I heard James's voice. He practically begged me to open it. I did so, and he just burst inside, panting. Michael, I knew you wouldn't leave. I knew you wouldn't listen. Now we have to brave this storm together. You and I... The drunk and the fool, he said almost out of breath. I could see a deep, unending fear nesting inside his eyes. My heart started drumming inside my chest, as if it wanted to create so much pressure against the ribcage for an untimely escape. James told me that he had infiltrated in his town a few years back. People didn't know it, but the town was cursed, and with it... So were them. First of all, James told me that him playing the town drunkard was a mere act. He had precise orders to gain everyone's trust and stay as low as possible. Some of the townsfolk were holding secret meetings in anticipation of the storm. He was part of a secret order that tried to stop all evil beings who tried to destroy humankind by any means necessary. Secondly, and this is why the storm was important in the whole equation, was that the curse that had been put on the town was the making of a long-forgotten, diabolical god. That god lived in storms. The bigger the storm, the stronger that he would get. He also told me that you can only see the effect it has on people only when there's a storm. You could see with your own eyes how the curse acts, and you could see the face of that god in the storm. Only if you watch closely. Fear took over me and I suddenly knew this was the truth and nothing but the truth. All those red flags were clear warnings. It was impossible for me to see them at first. Now though, everything seemed clearer. Our talk was cut short by the wind that started beating ever so violently outside. The whooshes and rustling of leaves sounded like screams of agony. James had peeked outside. Black hail started coming down from the gloomy sky. Each pellet was rhythmically hitting the roof of my cabin as a reminder that the end was drawing nearer. He said that we needed to get in the car and leave this town right away. 
The only really bad thing, though, was that we had to pass through it. James warned me that we would see horrible things and the storm might claim both of our lives. I thought that if there was even the slightest chance of escaping this, that I would take it in a heartbeat. I got in the car and I drove off into town. To my surprise, it had changed. The houses and buildings looked deserted. They were decrepit and old. It seemed like no one had lived there in ages. Passing by them, I saw the doors opening. People came out and they looked different. A cloud of dark smoke was enveloping them. Their eyes were just hollow sockets. Smoke filled them too and it looked like a small dark fire within them. The fear that was slowly building up inside my body was a sign that everything would go sideways if I lost another second in that cursed town. When I got my eyes back on the road though, a man was standing in the middle of it. I swerved past him and almost lost control of the car. The storm was growing bigger now. It seemed absolutely evil. The darkened clouds were filled with an ancient and terrible curse meant to bring the world to its knees. And then, for just a fraction of a second, everything went silent, and I heard someone crying. It was a little boy standing on a front porch. He was different from the rest of the people. His body was enveloped in a powerful radiant halo, and his eyes were as golden as the sun. I immediately drove to the house, Hey there, little fella. Hush now. Everything's going to be alright. Are your mom and dad inside the house? Are they okay? I asked while trying to calm him down. I don't know how I got here, mister. This is not where I live. A few moments ago, I was playing with my friends and now I'm here. Please, take me home. I'm scared. The boy said, sniffling. I assured him that we'll get him back to his family no matter where they are. He would be with them safe and sound. I put him in the back, and before going back to the car, James and grabbed my shoulder. This wasn't supposed to happen. I don't know how or why this kid got here, but I heard about his kind. There are kids across the country who develop teleporting abilities. As soon as we leave the town... I'll need to make a few phone calls, he told me. I felt like a new layer of fear was being added into my heart. This whole thing was impossible for me to believe a few days back. Evil gods that live in the sky. Kids with superpowers. These things made me ask myself what else was out there. James told me that the boy needed to be taken to his home as soon as possible. If the government found out about him, it would be no good. He assured me that he'll take him to his order, and from then, he'll immediately be taken back home. Right before going back inside of the car, we heard a cacophony of growls right behind us. Some of those people were slowly coming towards us. They looked like they were guided, like they were controlled by something or someone. I looked up into the sky and one of the clouds had changed its shape to a face. Its eyes started blinking, its evil grin revealing a set of razor-like teeth. And then another cloud changed to the same face. And then another. And another. The whole sky was filled with millions of those evil grinning faces. And then they all looked at us and a cacophony of high-pitched screams pierced our ears. I felt a warm liquid coming out of them. I knew they were bleeding. At the moment the faces in the storm screamed, those smoke people started running towards us. James got in the car in time, but I wasn't able to. One of them grabbed me by the throat and started choking me. The rest of them soon followed. The kid was looking on from the car. He was screaming at the creature to leave me alone. Meanwhile, the screams in the sky continued. Sometimes they stopped, 
and giving way to evil laughter. I almost blacked out. I glanced at the kid and saw that he was just a shape made of light now. Leave him alone, he yelled from the back seat. At that exact moment, the smoke people vanished. It was like they weren't even there in the first place. The overcast sky soon became clear and it gave way to a big moon that almost seemed relieved by the fact that we had escaped alive from this battle. I got back in my car, still coughing. I looked in the rear view to see the hand marks on my throat. It was a close call. I turned around and I looked at the kid. You are really special, kiddo. I owe you my life. Thank you. No problem, mister. Those things were so mean to you. You saved me in the first place, he replied. I nodded and smiled back at him. We left that godforsaken town right away. I asked myself where those people go, and my burning question was, where did that god go? The kid fell asleep on the way back to my city home. James asked me to borrow the car and he'll have someone get it back as soon as the kid was safe and sound. I happily obliged. A few days later, I got my car back. The little guy called and told me that he was back with his family. He was alright. Just like I had promised. There is a storm that night. I was glad that it didn't catch me outside on the streets. I looked at the sky as the clouds were gathering and the wind moved them around as it wanted. For a moment, I thought that I saw something in the sky. An evil face that grinned at me and then vanished in a second. We found something under the water in the Everglades. We should have left it there. Written by, I escaped from a lab. Crap, I thought we had reached good dry land. We're going to have to go back to our kayaks. The gigantic, burly man said to me, as if not having to carry the 100 plus pounds of gear in our backs was going to be an inconvenience. We were about two hours from our launch site. We had managed to make it over in Earth and Ridge, which was bizarre in the Everglades, only to find the amount of Earth to be brief. The water shouldn't be that deep around land, but it's murky and you don't want to break your ankles, he said, slinging his small boat off of his back. I followed his lead and he gently placed his backpack on the tiny boat. It was 5.30 in the morning, and although I was already exhausted, I was stunned at the beauty of the sunrise as the ribbons of orange, blue, and purple crept through these strange turquoise and red bromeliads and thick expanses of mangrove that struggled to hold the land down in one place. It was my first time kayaking in the Everglades. After my divorce, I decided to take up some new hobbies. My ex took my son when she left me for a doctor that she was working with leaving me with a whole ton of free time. It was either drinking or focusing on something else, and I didn't want my son to think that I was a bum. I bought some snorkeling gear and a cheap kayak, so that I could join Mike, my last remaining buddy from college, during some of his adventures. He had also been through a divorce, but had assaulted his wife and her new bae after finding out that they were going behind his back. He had just gotten out of his six-month stint, and I figured it would help both of us out. He had let his anger get to him and was more obsessed with being cheated on than he was concerned with the well-being of his own daughter. And despite his problems, I felt like he was the last friend that I could hold on to. I was born and raised in Lake Worth, Florida, but I had never explored its intracoastal or the Everglades. So, uh, this area up here changes, like constantly. Sometimes you have almost solid land, sometimes you have waist deep water, and not too many ridges though. Let's put our kayaks down there, Mike said patiently. 
I secured my gear and followed him out to the water again, testing it after a moment to see the depth. Sure enough, my 10-foot paddle couldn't hit the bottom. How do you tell the difference between deep and shallow water? I asked, staring at the water. I couldn't even see an inch below the surface thanks to the incredible amount of aquatic vegetation. It was like looking at an underwater forest. You don't, Ted. I learned that the hard way. Mike said, laughing playfully as he paddled along. Even after three months, it was hard not to think of my kid, Kyle, and how much he might enjoy the experience. I was thinking about how much he enjoyed exploring the parks my ex Ashley and I used to bring him to, when Mike suddenly came to a hard stop as he paddled over the water. What the heck is this? He asked in confusion. What? Seeing as he was the more experienced, I was instantly worried. My kayak is caught. I think I'm over a rock or something. He used his paddles to try and turn around but couldn't. Give me a bump from the left. I think it's a rock or something. He tested the depth around whatever had caught him, and his paddle had no difficulty hitting the bottom, indicating that it must have been one huge rock. Alright, give me a second, I said going to his side and trying to help him push him off. When suddenly, I felt the side of my own kayak scrape against something hard. Crap, whatever it is, there is another one over here. South Florida doesn't have a lot of naturally unsmooth surfaces in general, but in the Everglades, it was kind of strange to run into features that hadn't been ground down by Mother Nature. I managed to avoid the rock and help Mike get free. Wondering what could have caused it and the ridge to begin with. You want to put your snorkel on and see what it is? Michael asked, excitement in his voice. I don't know how he planned on seeing anything in water that was absolutely choked with vegetation. But I was also pretty curious as to what was sticking out of the water like that. Yeah, I guess we kind of have to, right? I heard myself say reluctantly. The sudden memory of the existence of alligators and the light slowly coming back to me. Mike put on his absurdly long snorkel and goggles and I followed suit. I found a spot that had enough land underneath it to hold our kayaks and I jumped in first. I took a few moments to psych myself up before going in after him. The world under the water was a stunning forest. The light managing to penetrate the thick canopy in incredible, vibrant shafts. The vegetation didn't go very far below the surface, allowing us to swim easily. I made my way over to Mike and followed him to the spot, but we saw what had caught him long before we got there. It was a crude statue of an alligator standing up on two legs, carrying a staff. The small area that we had paddled into seemed to have several other similar statues, forming a tight circle in the water with only a single entrance that we must have accidentally passed through. Mike just swam in place, staring at it for a moment before motioning for me to follow him to the surface. What the heck? He asked me, as if I would know who had placed it there. Maybe it's a Native American thing, I suggested. No, not possible. The Seminole rarely bothered with areas this far south, and before them, it was just Aeus and Jaga. There are no records of them doing any kind of stonework. Maybe they're more recent, he asked, probably knowing that I wouldn't know the answer, but it didn't feel likely. The statue had a primordial look to it. We, we should get some pictures, he said, clearly shaken. As we dove below again, he moved to some of the other statues. They were easily 15 feet tall each and it was hard to imagine how someone would drag something so large out to the middle of nowhere. They were of animals that were once common in Florida. The Florida panther, a manatee, key deer, a strange bear, and a saw-toothed fish and several others, each of them standing upright, with human-looking legs. Strange hieroglyphs adorned their sides, still barely visible. The quality of the statues was absolutely stunning, their details precisely measured despite their foreign-looking artistic style that, at first, looked crude. As I finished investigating and photographing these symbols on the deer, 
I noticed Mike circling the area in the center of the strange circle. As I approached him, I saw why. There was one last statue, clearly larger than the rest. It was of a woman. But as I got closer, I saw that there was something wrong. Instead of eyes, there were small crab-like creatures intricately carved out of the stone, and another emerging from her mouth. More of the crustaceans seemed to cover her arms and legs. Aside from that, her face seemed to indicate pure ecstasy. As I stared in horror at the thing, Mike motioned for me to look down. I couldn't see much through the water, but he took off his snorkel and began diving. When he got near the bottom, he turned his light on, revealing the floor of the area to be covered in strange, multicolored, crawling crustaceans. As they fled, they revealed a large stone table that sat at the base of the statue of the woman. Mike seemed to investigate it quickly, and then swam back to the surface as fast as he could. I followed him and removed my mask. Holy crap, dude, he said, staring down at his hands. What is this place? I asked, staring around the clearing to see if there were any signs of people having dragged and dropped at these massive statues. The pseudo lake that contained the circle was hemmed in by trees and raised land that looked unbroken. I don't know, but look at this thing, Mike said, barely containing his excitement. I swam over to him and my jaw dropped. It was a mask, carved out of the same kind of pale blue stone, and it was uh, truly beautiful. Mike gestured for me to look more closely, so I reached out to touch it and it sent more than a shiver up my spine. It was like my entire body reacted to it. I think maybe we should mark this place on our GPS. Maybe come back later after we've done some research, he said dreamily, not taking his eyes off of the mask. Yeah, we should make sure we're not disturbing something important, I muttered, trying to hint that maybe it wasn't a great idea to take the mask, just in case it was an archaeological find. But I didn't argue the point. I wanted to take a closer look at that thing, too. We paddled back to our trucks and packed up. Mike didn't even bother cleaning off his kayak, and he was normally a stickler for following procedures like that. We headed back to his place where we used Google to do some research on statues in the Everglades. Modern artists leaving statues in the water, tribes in the area, weird crab lady religions and anything else that we could think of. The only historical reference to anyone ever living in the area that we could find was of the Spanish sending in a small military contingent to slaughter an entire tribe of restless natives that seemed like they probably lived in the general area but that was barely a footnote and didn't mention any statues. I stayed at his place, going over everything over and over again until it was at least at night at night. I think I'm going to email these pictures to some local professors, maybe the Seminole tribe too, I said, thinking it was the logical next step. I was thinking the same thing, but we shouldn't be specific on where we found it, in case they want to steal our find. How about I try and find out what kind of stone this mask is? I know a guy who knows his way around this stuff at work. I agreed but was reluctant to leave until Mike flat out told me that he wanted to sleep. I went home only to realize the moment I was in the truck that I was starving, having not eaten the entire day. I stopped at Curry to Banca to pick up some curried duck doubles. Kind of like a flatbread sandwich with curry chickpeas, a Trinidadian favorite. I only realized as I was eating that every muscle in my body was screaming out in pain from the relatively large amount of hiking and kayaking that I had done that morning. I went to sleep the moment my head had touched the pillow, but instantly found myself back in the small clearing. This time, however, there was no water and the statues loomed over me with brightly painted faces. It was nighttime, but fire's litter on the circle allowed me to see a group of people wearing grass skirts staring at me. I knew it was a dream, but that didn't stop it from looking and feeling real. A tall, beautiful woman admits them beckoned for me to join them, smiling gently. I woke up before I reached them. 
The next week, I went to work and tried to focus, but I couldn't. I wasn't bothered by my lingering divorce anymore, though. In fact, I ignored several calls from Ashley, only checking my messages to make sure that they weren't emergencies. She wanted to know if I could help her and her new husband move. An appalling thought. Ignoring her allowed me the freedom to spend most of the week googling Native American statues and carvings to see if I could find anything like what I had seen. I couldn't get the mask out of my head. The intricate carving seemed to have a slightly wiry smirk and haunting and beautiful eyes. I didn't remember any more of my dreams, but I woke up from one with the impression that I had seen Kyle in one of them. I had to see it again, and it pushed Kyle out of my head. I bided my time and ignored Ashley's pleas for help, even ignoring an attempt to see Kyle on the weekend. I knew that I was going to be busy with Mike. On Friday, I called him to see if he was open to hang out on Saturday, but really, I just wanted to see if he had found out anything about the mask. Nothing. No one seems to know anything at all. One professor told me he thought I was making it up because none of the tribes made stone carvings, and that it was illegal to dispose of made things in the Everglades. He threatened to call the popo. Mike laughed. Do you want to go back out, see if we can find anything new out there? I asked, hoping that he would say yes. He paused for a moment. Absolutely, he said, and we made plans to meet on Saturday morning, long before the sun came out. After the call was finished, another call came up and I recognized the number, John Gaffin, the man my ex had cheated on me with. How he could have the balls to speak with me was beyond me. My blood boiled, especially when I heard the message, where he asked if we could get a beer and I said that he didn't want to be my enemy. Well, maybe you shouldn't have banged my wife then. The anger bled away quickly though, turning my mind back to focus on that mask. I looked through my phone at the pictures of it, marveling at it through the images and wishing that I had taken more. When I woke on Saturday, I had a brief but distinct memory of being in the clearing again. I was thrilled, but Mike was almost half an hour late to meeting me at our launch site. He looked and smelled like absolute crab. He had clearly lost a good bit of weight during the week. Not like the amount that you lose on a diet. His clothes hung off him loosely. His face looked different too. Not just less fat, but strangely angular. Hey, sorry I'm late. I overslept. He muttered as he took his kayak out of his truck. Water spilled off from it, which surprised me. Either he had been kayaking again during the week, or he hadn't cleaned it or taken it out of his truck the entire time. So, did you bring that mask again? I was hoping to take another look at it really quick, I asked, hoping to sound innocuous even though I didn't plan on doing anything with it. What? Oh no, sorry. Maybe we could look at it at my place or something, he said dismissively as he put his kayak in the water, filling me to the brim with disappointment. I tried to hide my disappointment and just said, cool, as I followed him, but it consumed me. I had spent the entire week wanting that thing, desiring it, and a part of me thought that he knew that, that he must have understood how I felt about it. I felt deeply spurned, somehow even more so than I did when I found out that John Gaffin didn't give a crap about the things that I loved. For a moment, I couldn't help comparing my failed marriage to the mask, but I pushed the thought out of my head as we had reached the strange clearing. Mike dove in the water without even putting a snorkel on. I paddled up to his kayak and was about to do the same when I noticed a small brown waterproof sack that I hadn't seen him use before. I opened it up out of curiosity and there it was. He had brought the mask with him. The deception hit me like a hammer. How could I trust him now? With the thing that I suddenly desired the most after he had lied to me about what he was doing with it. I put it back and put my snorkel on, not wanting to alert him to my suspicion. I dove in just as he came up to gasp for air, 
but he didn't say a thing before going back down. I meandered about the statues as he went back and forth between the table and the surface. He left some lights down at the bottom, and they revealed him to be frantically searching the table, underneath and around it, as well as the statue of the woman. The strange crabs didn't seem to mind, and eventually began crawling back to the area. I felt as drawn to the woman as he must have, and went to investigate her. Aside from the bizarre anthropods covering her, she was beautiful. The statue was so stunningly well-preserved, with barely any wear and tear. The symbols could still be visible, although some were less preserved than others. I ran my fingers along her arm and felt chills run up my spine as it had been when I had touched the mask. I knew somehow that it was the woman from the dream. I stared in shock at her face and the crabs. They were the same as the ones at the bottom of the pool. Somehow, I just knew it. I took off my snorkel and dove down to confirm my suspicion. Sure enough, they looked the same. Multiple sets of pincers and horrible claw-like appendages surrounding their mouths. The crabs turned to face me as I approached them, almost attentively. I looked around and saw Mike shaking his head in frustration and swimming back to the surface again, so I followed him. You find anything? I asked, hoping that he didn't notice his bag had been opened. He shook his head and he gasped for air repeatedly. He had taken quite a few dives with only a quick gasp in between them. Something missing. There's something missing. There's supposed to be something there. He said desperately before going back down for another dive. I didn't ask him how he knew something else was supposed to be there. I could feel it to a much lesser degree. Something was supposed to be there. It needed to be there. Something was missing, and it felt powerfully inherently wrong. Eventually, Mike gave up and looked extremely upset about it. It was bothering me too, and we remained utterly silent on the way home. I asked him if he wanted to do it again next week, and he grunted and nodded at consent. But that was it. I didn't bother to ask him about going back to his place. When I got home, I checked my phone and realized that I had a missed call from Ashley. But when I checked the messages, it was Kyle who wanted to speak with me. I remembered that I hadn't even spoken to him since the first trip through the Everglades. And that gave me pause. I thought for a moment that this was the first time that it ever happened in his life, but remembered it wasn't. I had forgotten to talk to him when Ashley and I first split up too. As much as I wanted to go see the mask again, this thought somehow managed to weigh more. I called them back and apologized, telling them that I had been given extra hours at work. Hearing him talk back brought a spark of joy back to me. It made me realize that focusing on the mystery of the mask as well as hating Ashley and her new bae had something in common. They weren't making me happy. Kyle made me happy. I wondered what the heck the mask had done. I didn't believe in spirits or anything like that, but something was horribly wrong with Mike. I told myself that he must have finally gone nuts and I tried my best to ignore the memories of how I too had felt. When I went to sleep that night, I was in the clearing again. Just like before, the statues loomed over us instead of being submerged. This time, I was standing directly in front of the natives. Their faces and bodies painted bone white aside from the woman. She gestured to the stone table and then to me, sadly. Something was missing. She gracefully touched my arm and the memories of my life flooded through me uncontrollably. I felt strangely ashamed, as if I had been caught being unfaithful, as if it had been expected to give something to do something. She said a word to me that I couldn't recall when I woke up. As I showered, I decided to not go out to the Everglades with Mike again. Something was more than just wrong, and it was probably best that I stay the heck away from it. It occurred to me that he never told me what kind of stone the mask had been made of, and I did some research. The names of the professors he had told me in the email didn't bring up anything. I was willing to bet that he had never emailed anyone, 
never showed the mask to his buddy at work. Somehow I guess that he probably hadn't even been to work, despite it being the kind of thing that would upset his parole officer. A Sunday rolled by and another call from John came through. I ignored it. Of course I wanted more time with my son, but I hated that man with every fiber of my being. He called a couple more times but didn't leave a message. Work that week was less stressful than normal, and by Wednesday, I was still struggling to forget the mask, trying to turn back to being concerned for my work and Kyle's well-being. It wasn't easy, and I found myself looking at the photos every time I went to my phone. On Wednesday evening, John called again and I ignored it. This time, however, he called over and over and over, not leaving a message. On the 15th time, I finally picked up. You son of a gun, you have no right to take Kyle. John screamed into the phone. What are you talking about? Like you don't know. Should I just call the cops now or are you going to bring him back? Your psychopath friend hurt Ashley, you piece of crap. The realization snapped my head like a whip. Mike had taken him. Mike had taken Kyle. Because the mask wanted Kyle. It wanted me first, but when it couldn't have me, it decided that it wanted him. He was the part that was missing. Suddenly, full-blown panic exploded in my head. Mike was going to take Kyle to the table and that I had no idea what was going to happen to him. But I knew that I would never have him again. I didn't take Kyle and Mike is. He went crazy. You have to believe me. We need to get Kyle back quickly. We don't have much time. John seemed taken aback by this and more frightened than I thought he would be. Okay, I understand. And for a moment, I'm willing to believe you. Ashley said that he looked off, so we need to call the cops. They'll handle. I cut him off. When did this happen? I demanded. I started calling you the moment Ashley told me, maybe 20 minutes. It was right outside of our apartment. I cursed myself for not picking up the phone when he had called. Picking up the phone could have made the difference between my son being safe or not. It had been almost 20 minutes. We don't have enough time, we just don't. It might already be too late. I screamed, realizing that whatever was behind that mask, whatever force had worked through the situation, was going to take my son away forever. As I got into my truck and started barreling down the road, I told John about the clearing and that Mike was obsessed with it. He asked me where the nearest launch site was and we agreed to meet there. I didn't think it was remotely possible enough to paddle fast enough to keep up with Mike, but I had to try. We got there in record time, and despite the situation, it was still awkward as heck. I tried to push all of the anger I had towards the man out of my head as he stepped out of his Lexus SUV and nodded to me. I almost mentioned something about it, but he pointed to the rear of his vehicle, and I realized that he had a trailer attached to it, and on that trailer were two jet skis. Thank God, I shouted when I saw them. He didn't say anything and we unloaded them into the water. And despite having to go a longer way to avoid the areas, Mike and I had hiked over on land or through shallows. We started nearing the clearing in at the tensest hour that I had ever felt. So hopefully faster than Mike. From a distance, the faint glow illuminated the area surrounding the clearing. And the light made it clear that the clearing didn't just have a ridge. It had a massive circle of raised earth rising from the water. The circle broken only by the route Mike and I had taken into the circle. Otherwise, it was like an earthen fort. I had seen in the pictures of archaeological digs. As we pulled up to the exterior of the area marked on my GPS, I saw it. Fires lit around the circle. John slammed his jet ski directly into it, shattering its nose as he leaped from the vehicle. As we climbed through the mangroves, I gasped in astonishment. The water was gone, drained from the clearing and turning it into a pit where the statues loomed blocking the view of the interior. Mike's kayak was there, next to a shovel and some industrial equipment in a tent. This is where Mike had been living. That thing had consumed him. 
The interior of what was now a pit was lined with an earthen stairway. Mike, where the heck are you? I screamed at the top of my lungs as I raced down the earth pathway to the bottom of the pit with John right behind me. When we got there, we both stopped for a moment and stared at the scene in front of us. The crabs were still there, facing the table attentively, their claws raised to the air. Mike was there behind the table in front of Kyle, who was hogtied on the stone table. Except Mike wasn't Mike anymore. His obsession had consumed him entirely. He was rail thin, but his arms and legs were strangely long, pale, and shiny. His face was concealed behind the mask. But I saw it move strangely as he hissed at us, and realized that anthropodal-looking pincers were holding the mask in place. I rushed forward to grab Kyle, but knew I was going to be too late. Mike raised a terrible-looking knife made from sharpened stone over my son with both arms, preparing to bring it down when suddenly I heard an incredible bang, followed only by a ringing in both my ears. Mike staggered back for a moment as I rushed forward, but another two bangs rang out, cutting straight through the ringing. I felt the crabs pulling angrily at my legs, their pincers cutting into my flesh. I grabbed Kyle off the table while Mike fell backwards and the knife flying from his hands. As I turned to get out of there, I saw John pointing a revolver at Mike, smoke flowing freely from the barrel. He fired it two more times as I ran up the stairway and when I looked down, I saw that one of the shots had connected to Mike's face and blown the mask and his skull apart. Instead of a skull, however, there were horrible folds of chitinous material and two pincers still scrambling desperately in the dark, even as the crabs rushed greedily over his body. We untied Kyle and made sure that he was alright, and then we all climbed on the one good jet ski that we had left and we started back home. I hugged him for what must have been an hour before he finally went back to his mother and John's SUV. I still hated that, but it was a lot easier to push it aside. Since then, John and I had enjoyed a few beers. I came to realize that the divorce wasn't entirely Ashley's fault. I had my own problems and we just weren't working out. It still hurt that she cheated on me, but it is what it is. No one ever found Mike's body, although his parole officer did call me once. Apparently, he had left his GPS unit at home, so I told them he must have gotten lost in the Everglades and acted sad. I did eventually touch base with some professors, but apparently the natives in the area were relatively normal, straightforward people who mainly just enjoyed fishing and wanted to be left alone. Whoever used to live in that earthen mound seemed to have little to do with anyone, and it was apparently likely that the other natives avoided the area. Most importantly, since then, I have never let my anger towards Ashley get in the way of my relationship with Kyle, and I have never missed a phone call since. Don't Trust What You See in the Darkness Written by Victor Gray writes Another restless night. These were quite common for me now after long days of surgery. Sometimes my hands wouldn't stop shaking from all the stress and fatigue of using them all day. Gripping a scalpel and having to be exact, precise, so I don't kill anyone. I would never say I didn't enjoy the work. I loved it. I didn't enjoy staying up late at night though. It was the middle of my next rotation and I was only halfway through. I was relieved for a four hour break during the slowest time of the night and allowed a brief reprieve before my next 16 hour shift. Another 48 hours of this to go, not counting the breaks that I would get. I loudly sighed as I continued to stare at the ceiling, wondering if this was it. Was this my whole existence? What I was expected to do for the rest of my life. And periods of busy work followed by rest periods with nothing else to fill the void. I was tired of thinking like this. Just lying in bed, wallowing. I groaned as I stood up. My hands were not the only exhausted part of me. 
As I shuffled toward the window, I could see a small beacon of light peeking through, staining the floor from the streetlights outside. I moved the curtain aside enough to see the surrounding streets. It was often empty at this time, but it seemed even more so this time. As I glanced around, trying to find something to keep my mind busy, I could see that one of the streetlights was out. Strange. And the city was usually on top of this. As I continued to stare at the dark patch of sidewalk, a small white figure slowly materialized, a stark contrast against the dark sidewalk. And the white figure was lying on the ground, a pool of pale liquid spreading outward from it. I rubbed my eyes hard, thinking that I had imagined things. Was that a person? It was hard to tell in the darkness. I continued to stare as the pool grew more prominent, spreading out to the edge of the darkness under the streetlight. It stopped just before it reached the light of another lamp, however, I decided to act. I had an oath to do so, and whoever this was seemed injured. Invigored by what I had seen, I had more than enough energy to throw on a robe and grab a nearby medical kit. I always kept one on hand for emergencies. When I arrived downstairs, the streetlights were blinding, much brighter once below them. As my eyes adjusted, I could not see any figures in the darkness ahead. I shook my head and pushed onward toward the dark patch of street. It was likely just due to my eyes adjusting to the light. I just needed to pull whoever it was into the light and I would be able to help. As I stepped onto the dark patch of the sidewalk, I felt a lump settle on the bottom of my stomach. I was overcome with nausea as I realized that I had not stepped onto the sidewalk, and I was instead falling forward into the darkness. I yelped and moved my hands to brace my fall, expecting to feel the hard, cold cement, but instead felt nothing. I tumbled forward and began to spiral downward into darkness spinning faster and faster as my surroundings were intertwined entirely with pure black. I could see nothing. The wind was knocked out of me as I landed on the ground, and I struggled to catch my next breath. It took a couple of moments for my eyes to adjust, but I felt them widening at my surroundings as they did. I sat up and glanced around, trying to understand what I was seeing. The ground was Prussian blue, with dark tendril-like fingers spread across every surface, almost like black vines and moss. I could only see a couple of feet forward into the darkness before my vision died off. On the ground in front of me was a white trail of liquid smeared across the floor. Tufts of tendrils ripped through and pulled apart. I reached over to my medical kit and was able to find some gloves. As I snapped them on, I touched one finger down into the liquid and dabbed some on the tip. I held it away from my nose and sniffed lightly. It smelled strongly of garbage, laced with a sickeningly sweet smell that I could not identify. I wiped my finger on the ground and kept my gloves on, standing up slowly. As I stood to my feet, I felt my breath rasping in my chest. The fall had hurt me worse than I thought. I glanced up up above me and only saw darkness. As I sighed, I realized there was only one way to go. I started to follow the trail forward into the darkness. As I progressed, my vision seemed to adapt to see further, but my surroundings did not change. Before long, I realized that the road ahead was widening an entryway into a large alcove. I stopped at the entrance to the space and stared ahead, my heart starting to beat faster in my chest. The trail of white liquid stopped at the edge of a raised part of the ground. Laying on the floor on top was a completely black creature, a dark void barely visible in the room. It lifted its head and looked at me, black eyes seeming to pierce through me. I could see that its face was vaguely humanoid in shape, but that was the only resemblance to myself. 
And the creature had a large body with multiple limbs jutting out at random angles from the neck down. And the limbs were covered with black tendrils, matted with liquid that something had smeared over the creature's limbs. It opened its mouth, and a loud shriek emitted, echoing through the cavern and rocking my entire body. And before I could stop myself, I was walking toward the creature. As I got closer, I could see that the beast had smeared the white liquid all over its face. It didn't have much time to think as it jutted out one of its limbs in front of me. I could see that there was a large tear down on the segment, a white ooze leaking out slowly. The creature stared at me as I looked at the limb and seemed to nod its head at my back and then back at the leg. My arms were shaking as I sat on the bag. Did this thing want me to fix its leg? I didn't know anything about this thing. What if I made the wound worse? The creature seemed to notice my hesitation and shrieked loudly once again. I covered my ears with my hands as I stared at the beast in front of me. This time, I saw that its mouth was full of razor-sharp teeth. As the shrieking died down, I tried to slow my breathing. Think like I am in surgery, just to concentrate on the task ahead of me. I was able to calm down some and grab the leg to look at the wound. It was a long tear, but not so vast that I could enforce the edges back together. I grabbed the suture kit from the bag and started work on the wound, slowly closing in the smaller edges before working across the more significant parts of the tear. This wasn't as easy on my own. Usually, an assistant would keep everything close together and neat. I doubt the creature cared if it had a scar, though. I forced the edge of the skin together as closely as I could. It felt like I was pulling rugged leather against a team of strongmen, trying to win some twisted tug-of-war. I was able to muscle the skin forward and pull these sutures through eventually. The wounds seemed to be closed off and I could see none of the strange liquid seeping out. The creature lifted its limb upward and moved it slowly before pulling it in closer to its body. As I started to pack up, I wondered at just what this thing was, why it had called me here. I heard a slow hissing sound growing in volume from in front of me. I glanced up as I finished packing and saw that it was staring directly at me, its head cocked to the side. Before I could move, two of its limbs jutted forward and grabbed both of my arms, holding them tight to my body. I could see that its mouth was opening wide as I struggled to free myself. Without warning, it bit down onto my neck, ripping a large chunk out of my shoulder. I screamed as hot blood sprayed outward, coating the creature in front of me. As I continued to scream in pain, it moved to more of its limbs forward grabbing me on both sides of the fresh wound. I could hear a sickening crunch fill my ears as my screams grew even louder. I glanced down to the left, trying to see between my squinted eyes as it tore off my entire left side, ripping my body in half. It dropped me to the ground, and I fell onto my back, blood pouring out on my left side. As I glanced upward, the creature slowly forced my left arm down its throat. Its body was bulging outward as it shoved the meat that was mine deeper inside. I blacked out from the pain before I could see any more. Even though I had shut my eyes, the sun still burned them. I suddenly sat up screaming. As I opened my eyes, I could see stunned people standing nearby on the sidewalk. They quickly walked in the opposite direction away from me. I immediately looked to the left and started touching my chest and neck. It was completely whole. Nothing was missing, which was some relief at least. I sighed as I glanced around my surroundings. I was outside of my apartment building, but something was wrong. Something seemed off. As I stood up, my body creaked and complained loudly, a consequence of sleeping on the sidewalk. I walked toward my apartment building, slowly trying to catch my bearings. As I got to the front door, I realized that my key was not working. I couldn't get in. That didn't make any sense. Why wouldn't it work? 
Myla to the side and started pressing call buttons for random apartments in a flurry, sliding my hand up and down. Eventually, one of them buzzed me through when I entered. I just needed to get back to my apartment and get some rest. I don't understand what happened last night, but some sleep would do me good. My whole body was complaining as I climbed the stairs. Why was this so difficult? I knew I was tired, but this was way harder than usual. I finally arrived at the entrance to my apartment. I shoved my key into the door, but it wouldn't turn, no matter how much force I put on it. Why was this so difficult? Did someone take my key while I was asleep? That didn't make any sense. Why would I still have a key then? I was racking my brain, trying to figure out what happened when the door opened. I felt my breath leave me as I tried to figure out what to say. My eyes met the person standing in front of me, and I realized that they looked exactly like me. Do I know you? The voice that entered my ears was my own. He sounded confused, but precisely like me. He seemed to stand back farther and cough some, and I realized that I stunk like garbage. My mind was racing. Had the creature somehow replaced me? What was going on? I had no control of my actions as I reached out and grabbed his shirt, pulling him close. What did you do to me? Who are you? What do you want with me? His eyes grew wide as I screamed into his face. It was clear he was just as confused as I was. However, his face grew dark as he shoved into my chest hard. I fell backward and down to the ground. Back off! What the heck is wrong with you? Get out of here before I call the cops. He slammed the door shut on my face. I sat on the ground, my mind foggy. What is going on? What happened to me? I couldn't stand it. My body was shaking too much. The thoughts ravaging my mind were intertwined with increased pain in my body from being knocked back. I slowly crawled down the hallway. I passed by a window as I reached these stairs and saw that I did not look like myself. I was someone else. Some older man. Crawling on the floor in a dirty bathrobe. The confusion was overwhelming. What was I supposed to do now? I looked like some old man. No one would be able to believe what had happened to me. I didn't even believe what happened to me. Was last night a dream, and was I always an old man? Am I some drugged out homeless man? I started to climb down the stairs as tears streamed in my face. I was sitting outside on the curb before I realized it, with my head in my hands. I could hear a loud discussion to the side when I finally raised my head. I glanced over and saw a man pointed at me while speaking with the police. My brain clicked on. I could barely understand what was happening, and I didn't need to be involved with the police right now. I slowly rose upward and walked down the street. As I passed a nearby alleyway, I cut down into it. I peered outward onto the road and could see that the police didn't follow. Works for me. I slid down to the ground and sat against the cold wall shadowed in the alleyway. I was still worn and tired from everything that had happened, and I laid down onto my side. I didn't care that I was lying on garbage-stained asphalt. I just needed some rest. I needed some time to figure out what was going on. My eyes closed slowly as the world faded around me. I awoke to a kick in the stomach. It knocked the wind out of me as I spewed out liquid onto the ground. The air burned my throat as I struggled to take my next breath. Before I could say anything, another kick landed, this time on my chest. I glanced up and saw two figures above me, laughing as I struggled for my next breath. And they let me lay there gasping until I had enough breath to move. I started to crawl away, trying to escape from the unknown assailants. I made it as far as the sidewalk before I felt a stomp on my leg behind me. A sickening crunch filled my ears as my ankle broke and I screamed. The laughing behind me continued as I tried to crawl forward, a white liquid painting the sidewalk below. I rolled onto my back, 
realizing that I could go no further. There was no escape. The sun was starting to set, and the streetlights were slowly whirring to life, all except the one that I was under. I could see the two figures beginning to walk toward me. Both of them had knives in their hands. I closed my eyes to accept my fate. When I heard a tiny tank on the concrete nearby, footsteps fleeing in the distance. I slowly sat up and realized the two figures had run away in the opposite direction, one of them dropping a knife. I grabbed it and held it close to my chest. Why had they run away? I heard a loud shriek from behind me and I quickly realized why. I glanced down just as a tendril wrapped its way around my body and legs. I tried to locate the source only to see the tendrils receding into the ground behind me. I didn't have time to think. I clicked out the knife and began to stab at the tendrils, deeply cutting one of them. A white liquid spurted outward and spilled onto the ground. The liquid stank as it spread out to cover most of the concrete surrounding us. The remaining tendrils did not loosen their grip, and they slowly pulled me toward the hole. One of the tendrils rapidly jutted out and wrapped around my hand, squeezing down hard until it forced the knife to fall. As quickly as the blade had bounced away, the tendrils pulled me down into darkness. My eyes tried to adjust as I felt my body dragged along the ground, streams of liquid in front of me as torn vines twisted away. My eyes adjusted and I realized that I was in the large cabin once more, this time supported in the air, suspended above the monster. It was staring at the wound on one of its tendrils, a large tear that was weeping out white liquid. It had brought the tendril to its mouth and slowly licked it clean before turning its gaze to me, face now smeared with the juice. The pure black eyes pierced into me as its mouth opened wide, more expansive than it had before. It began to slowly shove me into its mouth, my head entering its throat. I could feel the walls closing down on me as the sliminess coated my face, seeping into my throat. I could barely breathe as the creature shoved me deeper inside. Before long, I could no longer breathe, completely enclosed in the throat of the creature. I tried to struggle free, tried to move, but to no avail. The walls were compressing harder on me, and I started to choke from the pressure. I felt like my eyes were going to pop out as I fell unconscious from lack of oxygen. And then I awoke in my bed. My chest was heaving as I stared around the empty room. As I ripped the covers free, I saw that sweat had drenched my mattress, moisture that had escaped my body. It was night. I ran over to the blinds and ripped them open, staring at the street below. As my eyes darted around wildly, I could see that all the streetlights were on, all of them except for one. Lamps brightly illuminated the road and some people were walking on both sides. Everybody was walking around the shadow of the streetlight, seemingly oblivious that they were naturally avoiding it. I slowly pulled the curtain shut as I went to sit down at the edge of the bed. I was shaking as I pulled on my phone and scrolled through my contacts. I found what I was looking for before long. As the phone started to ring, I held it loosely up to my ear, breath still whistling in and out as I tried to calm down. The phone clicked and a polite voice answered on the other side. Is something wrong, Nolan? You've only been off shift for an hour. Don't be so eager to get back here, okay? I strained my voice the best I could as I spoke. I won't be coming into work for a while. I'm sorry I can't explain. I hung up the phone and threw it to the side. I could hear it rumbling underneath the bed as I laid down on my side and started to cry. Tears streaming down my face and staining the hardwood below. I never figured out what happened that night, what I had experienced. The streetlight still hasn't been fixed and it taunts me as I stay up all night, standing at my bedroom window. I don't sleep at night anymore.
This was the case that made me quit my investigating job. Written by Pika Pika Gamer. I pulled up to what would be one of the most memorable, horrifying, and disturbing crime scenes that shook me to my core. A 17-year-old girl gone without a trace in the middle of a September night. The CSI had already made their presence known, dotting the small suburban house with yellow evidence markers. I saw a good friend and a colleague of mine standing in the front door, shifting awkwardly from side to side, like a sophomore waiting for their homecoming date. David, good to see you, I greeted. Instead of giving me the warm, happy-go-lucky smile that I'm used to, he started to walk in my direction at a stern, brisk pace, which made my heart drop a little bit. Brian, there's something bad going on here. Come with me inside. We began to walk towards the house, but not before a woman hunched over, tears rolling down her face, came stumbling out of it, running towards an officer working crowd control. Please, she screamed. Don't tell me. Oh, Lord, please don't. She collapsed in the front yard. A local news camera making sure they got every second on tape. A young reporter then resumed his speech. As you can see, Lisa, emotions are running high right now. This is the 13th missing case involving a young teenager in the past two months. As you can see behind me, police are currently investigating he began to walk towards me. I quickly turned in the other direction, making my way into the house. It was a cozy, all-American family home, the kind you would see in stock photos on cookbooks. It was also small, so small that even though there were only about six of us in the living room, the air was already somewhat stuffy. My colleague turned to me. Brian, we've got a problem, a serious one. This was very unusual for him. Even in the worst of situations, he would always be hopeful, optimistic, a glass half full kind of guy. But this time, his words, his demeanor, cold, almost bone chillingly so. I turned to him and asked, David, what's happened? He began up the stairs, gesturing me to follow him. 17 year old girl, no change in mood or appetite. No serious medical history or mental health issues. We reached the top of the stairs. His brisk pace yet cold demeanor remained as we walked down a short hallway and turned into a bedroom. It was the typical teenage girl bedroom. Old pink walls, posters of boy bands, Polaroid pictures of old memories, and a bright blue book titled My Diary sitting on a white end table next to a large bed. You need to see what's in the book, he said, picking up the book and handing it to me. What's in it? I asked inquisitively. I flipped to the yellow bookmark. You almost sounded nervous, like you didn't want me to, but I had to. I flipped to a yellow bookmark with a diary entry. August 17th, 2001. Dear diary, I think that's how you start these. I never thought I would write in you, but I had nobody else to talk to because Kate's phone is busy. I never thought that I would see the day, but now I think she's finally got tired of our 17-hour discussions. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. I just had this amazing dream. I was in a field of flowers and the sun was not just warm, but it felt like my body was glowing with the sun. It was surreal. I met a woman who was standing in the field. She told me that I was the one that could help her bring happiness to the world. I asked her what she meant by that, but she said that it was a secret. But in time, I would know what she meant. And I had to write it down and keep the memory. And then I woke up. I know it's lame, but there was something different about that dream. It felt like I was there, but I wasn't, but at the same time I was. Ah, I can't explain it properly. I guess when my brain gets tired, it starts making up random stuff. So, I think this helped me get it out. 
I heard people wrote things like dream diaries, but I never really understood why. Maybe this is why. I'm not sure, but I guess it helped. So, I don't know how to end this entry, but I hope to use you again soon. I looked up from the book. My colleague was anxiously shifting around again. What's so bad about this? I asked. That's just the beginning. Here, flip to the 21st. He said, taking the book from my hand and quickly flipping the pages, being careful not to rip or damage them. A moment later, he handed the book back to me, this time more nervous than before. A new entry was in front of me again. August 21st, 2001. Dear Diary, I keep on having that same dream. It's almost identical every time. But this time, it was different. I saw Kate. K-A-T-E. She hasn't been answering her phone, but she does decide to ask or project or whatever that's called and visit me. I was in the same field as before, but this time there were tall trees. So tall it looked like they touched the clouds. A small stream with a tiny fish in them, and a rope swing next to what looked like a farm hung in the distance. The woman was also there too. She had a bright green dress and flowers of different sizes and colors dotted her hair. She was elegant, beautiful, graceful. I'm now realizing that I'm just describing Samantha, but I admit that I was envious of this woman too. She and Kay were standing next to each other and looking off into the distance. I asked them what they were doing. The woman turned to me and said, We are waiting, Kayla. We are so close now, and your time is coming too. Please be patient. It will be well worth the wait. And then I woke up. I'm honestly not sure how to feel about this one. It was peaceful, almost too peaceful. The kind of peacefulness I've never felt before, or thought, was possible. I think these dreams are helping me though. I felt more rested and relaxed since then. So I guess that's all I have to say. And by the way, Kayla, make a mental note to keep writing these down. I almost dropped my jaw when I saw that the last line looked wrong. It looked like it was slightly off from the lines before. Not so incorrect that you would start asking questions, but enough to the point where I knew there was something off. You see this too. We haven't been able to do a handwriting analysis yet, but CSI has their suspicions said David, almost as if he was reading my mind. There was almost no explanation for this. The fact that a detail like that would change all of a sudden unless it was being written by somebody else. But the reason someone else would write in this, I have no idea. It gets worse. Here, said David, as he gestured for me to hand him the book. I do when he starts flipping, a little more than before. And with a deep sigh, he hands it back to me. Again, a diary entry was in front of me. September 3rd, 2001. Dear diary, I just came home. I heard over the loudspeaker that Kate's missing. I nearly fainted. I was a wreck. I heard in the news that teens were running away or missing or something. But the fact that it would happen to her is making me go insane. I was a ball of tears and I just couldn't handle it. Mom picked me up and we went home. But I suddenly got the idea to write in my diary. I think it helps. I know I said that I would be strong but it feels like I can't be. I think I'll get some sleep. Directly below this entry was the second one. September 3rd, 2001. Part 2. To Diary. I saw Kate in my dream again, this time I ran away. I know this is someone trying to taunt me, or play with my feelings or give me false hope. I ran as fast as I could and I ran into someone. It was that woman again. She won't leave me alone. She said something to me but I couldn't understand it. I tried to run away but my body wouldn't move. Instead, 
I stood up and I faced the woman again. She said something again, but I still couldn't understand her. I felt like I was suffocating and I couldn't breathe. And then I woke up. The room was pitch black and I tried to gasp for air, but I couldn't. I couldn't even move my body. I tried to scream for mom to help, but I couldn't do anything. And even though the room was pitch black, I saw someone or something standing in my room. I know it wasn't mom. I was scared. And then, in a moment, I could move again. Light filled the room as I then noticed my lamp was on and the thing was gone. I don't know how to feel right now. I want to tell mom, but something inside me is telling me not to. So, I guess I have you for now. At this moment, I heard uh, something behind me. I turned in a man that I had recognized as one of the CSI people from the living room stood at the door. Mr. Arnett, I think you need to see this. I turned back towards David. He gestured to hand the book back to him. I did and he put it back on the end table. The three of us made our way to the living room. I could see from the window that a small crowd had formed outside, larger than before. More people from CSI had come, passing us on the way down the stairs. The man walked into the small dining room and kitchen that connected directly to the living room. We walked over to a cork board and then stopped as he pointed at a post-it note. We believe that this was written by the victim. It looks like it coordinates, he said, waiting for a response. We know where they end up, asked David. I just found this, but I think it might clue us in on where she might have possibly gone off to. Give me ten minutes or so and I'll let you know. Just then, another colleague of mine burst through the door. It was Nathan. He was out of breath and looked like he had just ran a marathon. Brian, we have a problem. He could barely get the words out. You're telling me, I interrupted. He stood up, looking at me before speaking. We have a new missing person, 16-year-old Asian male. The school said he didn't show up this morning. Parents said that he would never skip school. Nobody's seen him since. The room fell to a stunned silence. I couldn't believe that this situation somehow went from bad to worse. Nathan spoke again. We've kept the media at bay for this long, but I don't know if we can do it anymore. Not again. Suddenly, a noise broke from the silence of the stuffy room. A crash of glass stopped everyone on their tracks. Almost without thinking, the three of us, David, Nathan, and I ran upstairs, each searching one of the three rooms trying to find the source of the sound. I searched the master bedroom, Nathan searched the bathroom, and David checked Kayla's room. The CSI guys were also searching the master bedroom, but it didn't seem as if anything broke. And that's when I heard David from down the hall scream, Did anybody take evidence 28? I turned and walked out of the bedroom. David was already flying down the stairs. Me and Nathan looked at each other before walking into Kayla's room. The bedroom window was smashed, and more importantly, the diary was missing. At the same moment, I heard David's voice again, this time louder than before. Did anybody take evidence 28? There was a pause. No answer. Crap. I could hear David rush all the way down the steps, and he ran around the side of the house, and I could see him out the window. He was searching for an explanation as to how someone jumped through the window and took the diary. This doesn't make any sense. What is going on? I then heard the same man from CSI again from behind me. Mr. Arnett, the cords lead to the wooded area just west of here. I then turned and looked out the broken window and shouted at David to get his butt in the car and start it. I and Nathan ran down the steps and jumped into the car. I had never been to that area before, but I knew generally how to get there. Breaking every rule of the road and running every red light there was, we made it to the location in less than 10 minutes. The trees here were old. It didn't look like anybody had been here in a long time. We got out of the car and began walking. The exact location was a little bit of a walk and there weren't any roads that we could drive on. As we walked, 
The crunchy leaves from under us started to get slightly louder as they came from somewhere else. I held up my hand and we all stopped. The sound was coming from a little up ahead. It sounded like they were walking further away. We all began to run, shouting Kayla's name the whole way there. Suddenly we saw someone, a 16-year-old Asian boy. Nathan instantly called out for him. Day, are you okay? He didn't acknowledge us. Nathan ran after him, but suddenly stopped and fell over, as if he had run into a wall. I walked over to help him. His nose was bleeding. I stopped and reached out my hand. There was some sort of invisible wall that blocked me from moving forward. Suddenly, from behind a tree, a creature walked out. It wasn't human. It was something else, something that I've never seen before. It held the boy's hand and for a moment, he turned to face me. There was a look of pure joy on his face. The two then walked behind a tree and disappeared. The three of us stood there. We were scared and confused. We all walked back to the car and there was something on the hood. It was the diary. It was opened. Opened to a page that I hadn't read before. I read it aloud. September 7th, 2001 Dear Diary, the dream won't end. Every night, the voice is louder and I feel worse. I feel like I'm going to puke every morning. I'm awake tonight and something came out of my eye. It was blood. I've made up my mind. I will go to the place that she asked me and meet him. She said it will stop the pain. I don't know what will happen, but I don't care anymore. I must find out why this is happening to me. This might be my last entry in this. I won't take it with me. I hope whoever's reading this knows that this was not my choice and I never wanted this. I love you, Mom. I'm sorry that I couldn't be stronger for you. I don't think I'll be coming back. Goodbye. Two drops of blood dotted the bottom of the page. I flipped to the next one, but it was empty. As I finished, I saw out of the corner of my eye, David get on his radio. Hey Mike, I think you need to contact someone from PR. You're not going to believe the stuff we're seeing. And that's where the story ended. I quit a week after. Thankfully, no more kids went missing after this. But I was left with one of the most haunting experiences of my life. The September 11th attacks flooded the media which made their cover-up job much easier but I haven't been able to sleep well. I keep having this dream. I'm in a field. I met a woman. And I wake up feeling great. There is a hidden ninth planet they don't want you to know about. Written by Magic Josh by Gosh. Alright, this might sound crazy, but Earth, Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, Neptune, Saturn, Uranus, and Venus aren't the only planets in the solar system. There is a secret ninth one that NASA, and possibly others, don't want you to know about. There's this old tale in astrophysics or astronomy, or something, that regards a theoretical planet called Counter-Earth which is a planet on the complete opposite side of the sun. And it's kind of hard to prove or disprove, considering we can't see it because it's blocked by the sun. And it would be pretty difficult to get all the way around in orbit to get to this planet. So, like last Thursdayism, it stands as a paradox. Or something. I honestly have no idea what I'm talking about, given I'm only a high school student. I do, however, know the answer to this counter-Earth paradox, and I'll probably make an update later if I find out more information. My story starts a week ago in a basement of a decently sized house secluded in the middle of an Ohio forest, where I sat in a swivel chair staring at a computer screen and waiting for it to take me to my fifth period, science class. One of my best friends, Mike, sat across from me at a parallel table 
feet up on the table and eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. The same as always. His lunch period was during this time, so he wasn't in class. He was browsing the very site on which you read this story right now. Every so often, turning his phone around to show me a meme that he found. I don't like my science teacher very much, so I usually looked over and read the memes. When my teacher instructed the class to finish an assignment on paper, I finished quickly and opened my book while waiting for everyone else to finish. I then heard a quiet, Hey dude, coming from behind the bug. So I dropped the book a little to find the face of my friend staring back at me, smirking. Yes? I remember asking him. Hearing you talk about planets and stuff reminded me of a thing my dad is working on at the CIA. He replied, bouncing his eyebrows a little. He did that a lot, mostly when he wanted someone to ask him to elaborate. His dad worked for the CIA and he was pretty high up, so I didn't see much of the guy. He usually had important government stuff to work on, so he wasn't even in the country very often. Even considering this, he was my dad's best friend growing up. So my family tried to hang out with his family as much as possible, which included a lot of time with Mike. He usually joined the other four people in our friend group in gathering at my house and attending school online. But today it was just him, because the others all had other plans. I sighed before inquiring, What is your dad working on right now? Mike's eyes looked as if they contained full stars as he continued. Well, basically, there is this theory that on the other side of the sun, there is a planet that's almost identical to Earth, but shrouded in darkness. Isn't that an already established theory? Well, yeah, but my dad's team found a bunch of evidence to prove the theory recently. They had launched a rocket with a rover on it a couple years back. A few days ago, a signal came back that showed the rover crashing onto an unfamiliar planet that no one recognized. Something about the sky being covered in storm clouds makes it so that no light reaches the surface. They don't know what to do with the information. They call the planet Thera. I figured they named the planet this because it keeps with the ancient Greek and Rome thing, while also rearranging the letters of Earth. I wondered why they didn't just call it Heart, or Thayer, or a wreath or something. I was obviously very intrigued with this information. You can't be serious. I told him in disbelief. As if he was expecting the answer though, he pulled out his phone and showed me a picture he took of his dad's computer when he snuck into his office one night, complete with the image of a dark, almost a familiar forest, colored a deep black and violet with trees the color of bruises. I just sat there, so in shock from this new information that I didn't notice the teacher continuing the class. I looked back down at my computer, unable to focus on class because of the news that I had just heard and saw. I heard the ding on my phone as he sent the picture to me, and I kept thinking, why would the government keep something this big from the public? Is it dangerous information? If so, what does it entail? I could only think of the what-ifs and the big questions. I didn't even realize when the teacher dismissed our class and let us all leave. Finally, I snapped out of my trance and I clicked off the tab, leaving class and going into math. I spent all of the next three periods thinking hard about what I had seen. When my last period Spanish had finally ended, which was in another room because Mike had French at the same time and I didn't want to be disruptive, I exited the tab and sat back in my chair, looking over at the door now separating me and my friend. I decided to try and get my mind off of it, finishing my Spanish homework and almost forgetting about the information. I only left the room when I heard a big commotion in the other room, and slid the door open to find Mike standing at the back door, backpack already on, slipping on his shoes in a hurry. I could see slight tears in his eyes as he tied his shoelaces. I asked him what was going on, and he answered my question in four small yet ominous words. I'm in big trouble. 
He then unlocked the deadbolt and threw the door open, running out of sight. I tried to catch up to him, but he was gone before I even got outside. I closed the door and entered the house again, grabbing my phone and texting Mike to see what was up. All I got as a response was, not now. Even as I tried to get more information out of him, he wouldn't respond any further. I remembered the picture, and now he had sent it to my phone over text. I tapped on it to look at it more closely, and the sickening image of the dark forest enlarged on the screen in front of me. I had to shut off my phone and gather myself before looking at it again. Late that night, I lay in bed, trying and failing to soothe my brain with memes, when I heard the recognizable ding of a text message being sent to my phone. A banner popped up at the top of my screen that told me Mike had sent me a message privately. Usually, if someone in our group had something to say, they would say it in the group chat, but not this time. Nevertheless, I was glad to know that he was okay. So I tapped on the banner and it sent me to the texting app. What I saw frightened me. All it was was a bunch of random letters and numbers and symbols, some capitalized and some not. I tried to decipher this strange code, finding the words game and damage in the mess, but figured those were probably just coincidences or something. I typed back a single question mark, and what happened next will forever burn into my memory. All he responded with was four words, each in a separate text. Look at the corner. I assumed that probably meant the corner of the dark forest picture, so I scrolled back up to tap on it again. My heart skipped a beat as I looked in the lower right corner. Standing there, barely visible, was a man, but not an ordinary man. It was pitch black, save for its eyes, which were glaringly white, staring deep into me. I was surprised that I hadn't seen it before, but there it was, clear as day, staring right back at me. I haven't heard from Mike since. In the week and a half since I last saw Mike, the other people in our friend group have visited my house to attend school. All four of them asked where Mike was and why he hadn't contacted any of them since last Friday, but I just didn't have the heart to tell them the truth. All I said was, he's probably sick and doesn't want to be disturbed, and then they dropped it. I'm honestly glad none of them have read it, so they can't read the story that I'm writing now. If they did, they would be in danger because I think I'm being watched. I didn't know what it was. But lately, I've been getting strange vibes from the basement, as if there is some invisible person down there watching me and my friends as we take our classes. Even more unsettling, two nights ago, our house alarm went off because the basement door, which opens to a huge forest with a river and everything, was wide open. Nothing had been stolen, which eased my fears a little bit, but I was afraid that the opposite happened. Something was placed here. I don't know, but I kept feeling like someone or something, like a camera or some other spying device was down in the basement, listening in on our conversations. Luckily, if this turned out to be true, I hadn't said a word about Thera, so they would have no reason to suspect that I know anything right. Although, as I write this, I realize one huge plot hole in my story. How the heck would they know Mike said anything in the first place? A chill is going down my spines as these words are typed into my phone, but I think they had a listening device somewhere on Mike the entire time that he was at my house. That doesn't matter right now though. I have to get this down before I think any more about being watched. I've been having these reoccurring nightmares almost every day since the incident. I'm running in that giant frozen maze from The Shining. Or at least the giant maze from when they visit the Shining world in Ready Player One, because I've never seen The Shining. And I'm being chased by those vicious creatures from Thera. I'm running and running and running, and then I just can't move anymore. 
I can hear the growling and roaring of the things behind me. And then I'm falling endlessly down a dark pit forever. And then I wake up. The only thing I've thought about for the past few days is what the heck is going to happen to Mike. I'm also thinking about what's going to happen to me. I'm so afraid something crazy is going to happen. That's why I'm writing this today. Something happened. So, a few days ago, my older sister, Lenny, her full name is Linda and she hates that name. She came back from a cheer competition in California and joined the rest of us in the group. To refrain from saying the friends group so much, I'll just call us the nerds because we're a bunch of nerds, to attend online school. She's a senior while the rest of us are freshmen, so she has a completely different schedule than us. But since she can't visit any of her senior friends, she hangs out with us. So, uh, let me introduce you to the rest of the nerds. There's Scott, the TikToker, and Davilim, whom we call Dave because of a long-running joke, and V, my girlfriend. And then there's obviously Lenny, the popular girl and the oldest in the group. Mike, my best friend, who usually tells me everything. And then me, the guy who isn't necessarily the main character of the story. But if he called me that, I wouldn't object. I tried to contact Mike so many times in the past week, but he hasn't answered any of my texts since the terrifying look in the corner incident last Friday. I'm worried that he might be in danger, and I'm thinking about talking to the rest of the nerds and going down to his house, which is just as secluded as mine, about 15 minutes up the road. That's also why I'm writing this update today. I haven't had any messages from Mike lately, but something weird was sent to my house yesterday. And let me set the scene real quick. I was looking through my story from the other day, reading the comments to try and find some advice on what to do, when I heard the doorbell ring. My dad was at work and my mom was getting groceries, so Lenny and I were the only ones in the house. I was in study hall, which was basically just a free period for online students, so I was up in my bedroom. I heard Lenny yell at me from the basement to get the door, and I begrudgingly got up. As I descended the stairs to the foyer, I listened for the sound of a second ring but didn't get one. As I neared the front door, I could see through the windows on either side that there was no one standing there, figuring it was just Amazon delivering a package. I unlocked the door and swung it open to find nothing there. I listened through the pouring rain for the sound of a car leaving the house, but I didn't get that either. And that's when I looked down and saw it. I immediately recognized it as the familiar sight of one of Mike's classic code breaker sheets. The stuff that he would always give us when he came up with a puzzle or a riddle for us. A small tear fell down my cheek as I saw it, realizing Mike was okay, and knelt down to pick up the paper. I looked it over, seeing a note written in his handwriting in the corner. I looked through the trees for any sign of him, but after finding nothing but a couple of squirrels, I closed the door and locked it. I went back to the basement where Lenny was sitting in the seat next to mine, listening to some video about World War II. I plopped down in my seat and Lenny looked over at me, clearly seeing my distress. What's wrong? she asked and I immediately held up the paper for her to see. She took it and, obviously recognizing it, followed her previous question with, Okay, seriously, what the heck is going on with Mike? Where is he? You obviously know something the rest of us don't. I broke down. I told her everything that had happened, from the story that Mike had told me, to the picture that he had showed me. I even showed her the picture, she was skeptical at first, but eventually believed me. I'd felt a mixture of relaxing and terrifying to confide in my sister after a week of silence on my part, both because I could finally get the weight off my shoulders, and because there might have been some sort of camera there, hearing me give away top secret government information. My attention was brought back to the paper that I had been given, and after I had finished telling my story, and I read the note in the corner, it felt as if my heart stopped as the words echoed in my brain. They tapped my phone, 
Don't text me anymore. Read The Outsiders for more information. The Outsiders was one of my favorite books a few years back. I hadn't read it in so long that I didn't know what he meant by read it for more information. And then it clicked. Mike was into puzzles and riddles of all sorts, but the type of puzzle that he loved the most was what he called a book code. He would take a bunch of seemingly random letters and numbers and give you a book to read, where each of these symbols corresponded to a certain letter found on different pages. It was very elaborate, and I always thought that he was a genius when it came to puzzles. I must have been going at the speed of my X-15 upstairs to my room. I dashed into my closet, shuffling through the bookshelf inside to find the book. I immediately ran all the way back downstairs and opened the messages app to decode the letters and numbers in the creepy text that he had sent me a week ago. And after a half hour of decoding, I finally found the message. Thera is real, and they know that you know that. The gnome statue is important. Don't look for me. There were a couple of errors in my decoding, but I could tell that Mike really didn't want me to contact him anymore. And then I noticed the mention of the gnome statue, and I looked ahead of me to find a porcelain Ohio State gnome statuette, one that got on my nerves all the time for always staring at me. I immediately stood up and walked over to the figure, looking back at Lenny who was staring at me as I went. I turned back to the figure, grabbing it with both hands and shaking it to see if I could hear anything. I didn't, so I took a deep breath and looked back at Lenny again and dropped the gnome. It crashed to the floor next to my feet, shattering into a thousand tiny shards. I glanced down at the destroyed figure, and what I saw was exactly what I had feared. A small, spherical camera was embedded into one of the figure's eyes. Lenny walked over to the mess and gasped when she saw the camera, covering her mouth with her hands. I noticed that she was crying, and admitted the only reason I wasn't doing the same was because I wanted to stay strong for her. I now donned to inspect the camera, throwing it down to the ground and stopping on it to destroy it. I got back up and I hugged Lenny, very afraid of what I just did. I heard my phone ding from the table across the room. I let go of Lenny to walk over to it and found that a number I didn't recognize had sent me a text. I swiped open my phone to read it, and yet again, my heart stopped. Now we know you know about Thera. For future reference, never go snooping where you don't belong. Stop stealing government secrets. Um, Thomas? Lenny said from across the room. I looked up from my phone to see what she was talking about. And all I remember after that was seeing a strange, creepy looking guy standing at the back door which is basically just one giant moving window with what looked like a gun pointed straight at me. And then I watched as he shot through the window, and then I blacked out as Lenny screamed. I woke up on the floor of the basement with a tranquilizer dart in my neck. The back door was wide open, and Lenny was nowhere to be found. I messed up, like really bad. No way I'm getting out of this one. Before I go any further, I was previously under the impression that none of those other nerds besides Mike had read it. Well, I was mistaken and boy, did that bite me in the butt. V texted the group chat my stories on Tuesday, right after I had posted my first update. This caption followed. Care to explain, Tommy? Yeah, I'm screwed. I scrambled to find a reasonable explanation for, first of all, the disappearances of Mike and my sister, and secondly, how I knew so much about the incidents. I couldn't come up with anything fast enough, so Scott and Dave ended up joining the interrogation. Fifteen minutes of sweat and heart pounding later, they knocked on my front door. I had to tell them everything. If I didn't, I knew they wouldn't forgive me. I was putting them in danger, but there were no cameras around me, right? I told them about Thera. I showed them the picture of the creature. And I explained the sudden disappearance of my sister. 
which even I was still trying to comprehend. I wanted to know why they didn't take me with her. All she did was learn the truth, and now she was missing. One day later, and my mind was still racing with questions. Why did they leave me? Why did they take her? Who was that guy? Why did they care so much about Thera? What even was Thera? I looked back up at V, Scott, Dave, after thinking these questions. V was standing over me, hands on her hips, with Scott crossing his arms over his chest behind her, and Dave next to him staring at me with a strange look on her face. Fine, I said through gritted teeth. We leave for Mike's house Friday night. Friday night arrived. I was looking through Reddit for tips on how to deal with the CIA hunting you down, but I got no good results when I heard the doorbell ring. My parents hadn't been home much since Lenny had disappeared, joining in the search party that had formed earlier today. I had feigned illness, despite wanting to find my sister, so I could go to Mike's place with the other nerds. I leapt out of my bed and ran downstairs to the front door, unlocking it and throwing it open to find the three most trustworthy faces waiting for me. I had put together a search packet to complete with flashlights, snacks, and bottled water, because I knew the others wouldn't be prepared. So, I reached into the bag to hand everyone some chips and flashlights, closing and locking the front door behind me as I ventured out into the darkness of the night. We started walking, listening to the chirp of crickets all around us, also almost crossing paths with a bear. It took the group about a half hour to get to his house. And when it finally showed up through the dark, we exchanged worried and excited glances, pressing on through the final stretch. When we got to the front door and out of habit I knocked. The door was already unlocked and slightly open though, which I thought only happened in the movies. I aimed my flashlight into the dark house that I used to call familiar. I guess nothing is familiar in the dark but this was so much different. It was as if all the memories I thought were good in this house had immediately died, strangled ruthlessly before my eyes. I stepped inside, pointing the beam around looking for something, anything that would signal the safety of my friend. I found nothing, which both soothed and boosted my fears. Come on in guys, I whispered to the others, it's safe, don't move. I heard the strikingly familiar voice of Mike's father beside me, the only difference being the pure raspiness highlighting the familiarity. The man was pointing what felt like a pistol straight at my head, and I immediately dropped the trash bag containing our supplies. I thrust my arms up in the air, now much more afraid. All right, Mr. McAdams, I stammered, shaking like a leaf. Everything's alright, we just came here to find Mike. Don't say his name. Mr. McAdams yelled at me through wet coughs. That was clear proof that I wouldn't find Mike here. I suddenly remembered a self-defense video I had watched a long time ago, after getting beaten up by some jocks. It went over how to disarm someone with a weapon, and I was instantly flooded with a rush of adrenaline. In one swift move, I had the gun in my hand and Mr. McAdams on the floor in front of me. I didn't even know how I did it. And then, as if some outside force was controlling my speech, I said angrily, Tell us where Mike is and why Thera is so important. For the first time, Mr. McAdams looked somewhat scared. I had never seen him scared before, but right now he looked like a gazelle with a lion in front of it. All right, all right, he said, standing up with his hands held high. All right. And then he began the epic tale of Thera. About ten years ago, a small company called Frostburn launched a rocket and a project to potentially get farther than the Voyager. A real secluded place, so you probably didn't hear about it. It went far, even built up more speed as it went around the sun. But a few years after the initial launch, they lost contact with it. They were initially confused and sad, but about five years ago, the cameras attached to the rocket reactivated, showing the image of a crashed rocket. 
it had crashed on a seemingly unfamiliar planet. Purple forest and black sky surrounding the camera. And then from out of nowhere, jet black humanoid creatures appeared from the trees. If you could call them that. And they made their way to the rocket. They began to rip it apart piece by piece until the feed was lost again. Now, even more confused, Frostburn quickly sent another rocket to the same place where they had lost contact with the first, a position halfway around the sun, but this time added an array of cameras to the sides and inside. This time, instead of losing contact with the rocket, it just suddenly appeared in the dark forest again. One second, it was moving through space, and the next, it was lying in a clearing with the dark creatures all around it. We call them Nightmen, the creatures, and they do not like humans, or at least human technology. They took the rocket apart again, this time more angrily. So Frostburn sent a third and final rocket, one that was already on course to Jupiter over to Thera, and managed to get this one to Thera and back to Earth, complete with samples of the ground for studying this was around the time when the CIA got involved. We called the study the Fermi Operation, based on the Fermi Paradox. What they found in the samples they collected was even stranger. What was in the samples? Scott asked behind me. Ground that didn't seem normal, continued Mr. McAdams. Made up of elements that shouldn't make up the ground. Things like gallium, neon, or germanium were prevalent through the samples, with mysterious other elements of which we didn't know the names of making up the rest of it. It was as if elements behaved differently on Thera, but none of us knew why. The life forms on Thera weren't even carbon-based. The nightmen were made from mostly strange elements that we didn't know of yet. But even the ones we did recognize were strange and not usually able to bring about life. This assumed planet was getting weirder and weirder. Something did not up about what he was saying. The strange elements, the makeup of these nightmen, the teleporting rockets. Something about it was a little fishy. And then it clicked. Hold on. I interrupted the man talking in front of us. How did you know the nightmen weren't carbon-based? It's not possible to get that from a video, especially considering elements apparently work different there. His eyes went wide as he realized his mistake. I knew that face and I knew it well. They had brought the Nightmen back to Earth. Oh my god, V said, realizing what was going on, covering her mouth and clearly freaking out. I'm sorry, said Mr. McAdams. But they just climbed on top of the rocket. There was nothing any of us could do when we really needed that sample. None of us cared. We just stood there, almost silent, waiting for him to continue. Look, it's not like there. He coughed into his elbow a bit. Sorry. But it's not like they're very dangerous against humans. They may be able to take apart a rocket quickly, but they're not very strong. I still wondered how elements could just work differently on Thera. I asked him. Elements are the same throughout the entire universe, I said. So how can they just act differently on another planet? He looked defeated as he gave his answer. Well, you know how I keep saying assumed planet and strange new elements? I nodded, making a face that said, Yes, that was a very obvious. Well, that's because Thera isn't what you think it is. It's not a planet. It's a portal. What are you talking about? I yelled at my best friend's father in front of me. He jumped back a little, and I guess I didn't realize how scary I was being at the moment. The Thera doesn't actually exist in this universe, said Mr. McAdams. That's why elements behave differently there. So, you're saying that there are literally other universes out there? V said, taking her hands from her mouth long enough to go on a nerdy rant. I mean, these potential scientific repercussions of this discovery 
Uh, they could push the advancement of human technology beyond levels we even thought possible. This is a... Uh, the... Shh, said Dave. Uh, keep talking, Mr. McAdams. Yeah, keep the guy talking about keeping federal secrets from the public that people should know. I snapped. I mean, how did you get away with all of this? I don't know, he replied. But we did. We took six Nightman from Thera. Figured out it exists and another universe and even... He started coughing into his hand. He turned around, back to us. And I looked around him to find the blood start to empty into his hands. Um, Mr. McAdams, I asked. Are you okay? I made sure to step back a little, so as to not disturb him. Yeah, he said, turning around and smiling. I could see blood staining his teeth, but it wasn't a normal color. It had a hint of violet in it. It's just that. Ever since I was put on the scientific team for studying the Nightmen, I've been feeling under the weather, like they were carrying some sort of virus. Scott stepped back. Nope, nah, -uh, he said, covering his nose and mouth with his shirt. I just stood there. V could tell that I was losing it because she had put her hand on my shoulder and trying to keep me calm. You're trying to tell us that you, A, lied to us about Thera, B, kept secrets from the public about it as well, and C, brought back actual interdimensional aliens from Thera. And now you're saying you brought back a space virus that could very well kill us all. Look, I'm sorry, but... Tell me what happened to my sister before you cough up your lungs or something. Well, I don't know what happened to Linny. I wish I did. Then what happened to Mike? He went silent. What happened to Mike? I raised the pistol that used to be in his hands. He sighed. I was just uh, doing my regular work when I heard a knock at the front door. I went to open it, and when I did, I found one of my friends from work. We talked for a little bit. But then he pulled out a gun and shot me. I woke up a few hours later. My wife and son were missing. So they tried to kill you? Dave asked. Yes. Mr. McAdams responded. Well, do you know where they would be keeping them? I continued. I don't, he answered, putting his hands on his chin as if he was thinking hard. Maybe they would... Uh, he started coughing again. This time, it was so bad he coughed up blood on the ground, and it was a lot. It didn't even look like blood anymore. More like grape jelly or something else purple. Between wheezes, he gasped. They'd... they'd put them in. His eyes rolled back into the back of his head, and he collapsed backwards on the ground. On his way down, he knocked over a bookshelf, which fell over to reveal a small door. How cliche for a government agent. Scott and V screamed as he fell. Dave gasped. I just stood there, even as they knelt down next to him to see if he was okay. I put my hand to my forehead and turned around angry. Is he alright? I asked. No pulse, V replied, looking up at me. Now I was fuming. Great, I yelled. That's just great. Now we'll never know where Linny and Mike are. They're gone. Tommy, you're yelling. Of course I'm yelling, I'm pissed off. I started toward the front door. I could feel V's hand on my shoulder again. But this time, I pushed it away, heading out to the porch. I slammed the door shut behind me. Crap. I yelled, throwing a potted plant into the woods beyond the house, hearing it smashed against a tree. I started to cry. I would never get my friends back. And that's about where it all went to hell. I saw the red and blue hitting the forest ahead of me before I even heard the sirens. I knew what it was. They were here. I threw the door open as I ran inside. They're here. Scott, Windows, and Doris, now. V and Dave, stay here. It didn't take long for Scott and I to lock out the doors and close all the windows. When we got back to the front room, the girls were shoving Mr. McAdams' body down a set of stairs behind the bookshelf door. Scott and I hurried down the stairs behind them, 
down into a techie room with a closet and couch, along with a separate room with a computer that showed all these security cameras feeds. V went over to the security camera room while Dave opened the closet door and dragged Mr. McAdams inside, and Scott knelt by the couch to pray. I just stood there, unsure of what to do. I realized that I should probably close the bookshelf door, so I did that, sealing us in the basement. Right after I did, I could hear footsteps in the house around me. They were searching for sure, and they were probably going to find us sooner or later. After I moved the door, I descended these stairs again to find that the girls had joined in the praying. I wasn't religious and they knew that, but I decided to join as well because if we were going to die, then I might as well. After a few seconds of not knowing what I was doing, I heard a sound coming from the now closed closet door. I opened my eyes to find everyone else looking at the door too, thinking that there might be an agent in the closet. I slowly made my way over to the door, placing my hand around the knob and turning. And before I finished turning the knob, V said, Wait. I turned around and she looked back at me and continued with, What if it's one of the bad guys? V, I'm sure it's nothing. The door burst open, revealing Mr. McAdams. Only he wasn't himself anymore. His eyes no longer had pupils and purple blood was oozing from everywhere. His skin was starting to darken, and he didn't even look human anymore. I quickly grabbed the pistol from the couch, adrenaline filling me, and delivered a loud headshot that deafened me and dropped him to the ground. I must have killed him. But with one victory came another problem. The bookshelf door immediately swung open and agents poured into the room from the stairs. I dropped the gun as they aimed their weapons at us. Everything was happening so quickly that I didn't even notice the thing that used to be, Mr. McAdams slowly picking itself up, grabbing onto an agent and pulling him to the ground. The others started to shoot at the creature so I yelled, Run! And I grabbed the gun of an agent before escaping the house. The four of us ran for ten minutes, stopping to catch our breath behind some trees. When we did so, we sat on a few fallen logs, everyone panting and sweating. What the heck do we do now? Scott asked. He threw his hands in the air as the sound of screeching flooded the woods. We should get back to my place, I suggested, and the others soon nodded in agreement. There will be supplies there and we can make a run for it later after we're full on food and water. I'm pretty sure I know the code to my dad's safe so we can get a couple of weapons to try and learn how to use them. Where is the nearest city or town? V pulled out her phone to answer her question. I think Cleveland might actually be the closest place, I replied. And even that's about an hour away. If we walked, it might take until morning. God, she exclaimed. We're talking like it's the end of the world or something. Like a zombie apocalypse. Well, Mr. McAdams did get right back up after both dying from a space virus and being shot in the head. Yeah, but at least everyone here is safe. Scott added, looking around at us. I turned to Dave. I could see that she was getting pale and suddenly, her eyes rolled back into her head and she leapt at Scott, tackling him to the ground as his screams echoed throughout the forest. I could hear these screeching of former agents that had become infected as I took V's hand and ran from my house. Scott! V screamed as I led her down the road. Dave! As we made our way toward my house, it suddenly hit me that we were running out of options. I listened to the sounds of Dave's and Scott's now inhuman house mixing in with the various wildlife in the forest. The very frightening thought entered my mind that their sounds might attract the others, but... I try not to think about it, as my legs continued to kick at the ground. No one would find us. For the next day or two, we were alone. Completely alone. And that was even more terrifying than anything I had seen in the past two weeks. So, this is where it ends. The final part. The deciding vote in what happens to the rest of my life. It's been over two weeks since Mike initially disappeared, and then six days ago, Lily was taken. I tried to get answers on Friday, 
but only ended up getting Mike's father and two of my best friends, along with a bunch of officers and CIA agents killed. Now I'm here, locked in this room, nowhere to go, with those things clawing at the door every second, completely and utterly alone. V and I had finally made it back to my house on Friday night at around 10pm, about an hour after we had trekked up to Mike's house to get some answers. Now, we were looting the fridge, pantry, and everywhere else for food and drinks to last us the longest. We had come up with a plan to go along the river until we found a city or town, because the rushing water would drown out most sounds. We filled bags with the supplies we found, but didn't want to travel at night, so we decided to get some much needed rest and head out in the morning. V called her mom at about 10.30. It was a short but really emotional conversation, but she had to cry silently, so as to not cause suspicion. She told her mom that she would be having an impromptu sleepover at my place. She also had to reassure her that no funny business was going to happen, but that's not important, and proceeded to hang up after saying I love you for probably the last time. She dropped the phone and immediately collapsed in my arms eventually falling asleep. I luckily didn't have to make that phone call because my parents had apparently gotten drunk after a useless search party because they didn't want to feel sad anymore. So a family friend drove them to her place for the night. I was glad they would be okay at least. I woke up again at around midnight and woke up V so we could get some rest in a more comfortable place. She said that she could go into my parents' room and I could sleep out in the living room on the couch, leaving a gun on the coffee table for easy access. She told me that she would be too scared, and that I had to sleep in the room with her. A little backstory on me. I'm the most awkward person on the planet. I have no idea how or why V became my girlfriend, and in the year and a half that we had been together, we had only even kissed once. And that was on accident. Going from that to sleeping in the same bed as her. Heck no. Not that I didn't love her, or whatever you call it if a teenager feels it. And vice versa. But I just felt very uncomfortable with even the idea of it. I came up with a compromise. Where I would sleep in a sleeping bag in the floor next to the bed, where she would sleep. I would also keep one of the weapons next to me that I had found in my dad's safe, just in case. She agreed and within the hour, she was snoring on the bed above me. I couldn't sleep, not because of the snoring but because of me worrying. I kept hearing the screeching of the nightmen in the background and it felt as if it was getting closer. I looked at my watch, 2.17am, I sighed quietly. But eventually, the next thing I knew, it was morning. I yawned, stretched, and picked myself up off the ground and looked up to the bed to find that V was gone. I started freaking out, and I grabbed the gun and began to search through the house. I found her in the kitchen, though, making pancakes for us. Pancakes, really? I asked. Cooking calms me down, she responded, especially making pancakes. I could see that she had already made a plate for me, so I sat down next to the island in the middle of the kitchen to eat. Thanks, I said, tasting a pancake. It was good. Dang, you are really good at this. She laughed, making a plate for herself. No, oh, thank you, Tommy. It's a special way my grandma used to make pancakes. She sat down next to me, grabbing a fork. This was the first time in weeks that I had actually felt good. It was nice. No, it was amazing. But we can't have nice things in this story, can we? A loud crash from the basement echoed throughout the entire house, and I immediately grabbed the gun and headed towards the basement stairs. I aimed my gun as I descended, V following close behind, and I found an infected agent roaming around. I held on my arm against V so she couldn't come any closer and pointed the gun straight at the creature's head. I pulled the trigger and it fell to the ground. I knew that it wasn't the end of it though so I ran over to it and dragged it by its feet out the back door. 
I tried my best to place it in the river to get it to float away, but it woke up and it started to attack me again. I pushed it off, managing to send it flying to the other side of the river and backed away. It didn't attack though. It just stood there, staring at me, from the opposite side of the river. I didn't care. I just ran back to the house. I pushed a table to the door, flipping it sideways to block the hole in it, and I took V back upstairs. I locked the door to the basement as we made our way back to our pancakes. That was around 8 in the morning. V and I talked and watched TV and played video games for almost the rest of the day, as we pondered what to do. We couldn't go along the river anymore, because the creature hadn't moved from the other side. That confused me. Were they afraid of fish or something? I didn't know. At dusk, which was around 9pm, V and I were watching some episodes of Friends when I heard something peculiar on the road in front of the house. There was only a little bit of light in the sky, so I got up from the couch and looked out through the front windows to see an infected agent running full speed at the house. V had gotten up to check what was going on, so I dove for her and tackled her to the ground as the creature crashed through the window right where I had been standing only seconds ago. It felt like an action movie, but I didn't have time to feel cool, because I had to take care of it before it screeched and attracted the others. It got up and so did I. I managed to kick it to the ground, grabbing the gun from the coffee table and striking the creature at the back of it. As it fell, it knocked over a cup of water that I had made for myself, dumping the contents onto itself. It screamed in agony as its skin boiled and burned, writhing on the floor. Everything clicked. The river, the water cup, the boiling skin. Water was their weakness, just like the aliens from Signs. The creature wasn't dead yet. I hit it with the gun a couple more times before, bolting up and hurtling toward the sink. What a great time to have a sink with a detachable faucet. I took the faucet and spun around, just in time to see the creature pick itself back up and leap at V, pinning her to the ground. I could see that she was fighting back, so I had dealt the finishing blow by flipping the switch on and showering the creature with water. It collapsed to the ground beside V, who quickly stood up and backed away as far as possible from it. I kept spraying the creature with water until it stopped moving, and I kept spraying it more. I finally stopped after about two minutes. I dropped the faucet, looking down at the thing that used to be a person. I turned to V who had a saddened look on her face. Tommy, she whimpered, uncovering her hands from her stomach to reveal a deep wound from the creature. The blood was an unnatural purple, and I knew what that meant. My eyes widened as she swayed a little in front of me, tears welled up. V, no, I said, stepping closer. No, she responded, holding out her hand to stop me from moving any closer. I don't know when I'm going to snap. V's breathing grew heavy and she started to sweat, swaying more and eventually keeling over. Luckily, I caught her before she fell, the pistol in my hand falling to the floor next to us. V looked up at me from my arms. I'm so sorry. She whispered, putting her hand on my cheek and wiping a tear from my face. V, please, I replied, another tear quickly replacing the one that she had wiped away. You're the only one I have left. Hey, she whispered in response. You'll be okay. I just know it. V, we can figure something out. I could see her blood slowly turning purple. Tommy... You have to do something for me. I knew what she was going to say before she even said it. I can't become one of those things. No, I won't do it. Tommy, it's not your fault. It shouldn't be you, but it is. V, I can't. You have to. It's okay. I know you still love me. Against my better judgment, I put my hand around the back of the gun, wrapping my hand around it and lifting it from the floor. Her hand fell from my cheek and landed on my shoulder. I placed the cold barrel against her head, and she strangely smiled. 
My heart started to pound to my chest as I imagined what I was about to do. I love you. I pulled the trigger. V's hand dropped her aside while my tears streamed into her face. I put down the gun and stood up, turning around and bawling my eyes out, trying my best to stay as quiet as possible. I was so angry that I did notice V's body slowly peeling itself from the floor, ending in a standing position behind me. I heard the growling before I turned. My head flipped upwards as I realized that I had filled the one thing she had told me to do. I whipped around, watching as she threw herself at me, tackling me to the floor and trying to scratch and bite me. My world was quickly crumbling around me. First Mike, then Lenny, and then Scott and Dave, and now V. She was the only thing left in my life that actually gave me hope for survival. Now I wasn't so sure. I threw V to my side, pushing off the ground and sprinting to the gun on the floor. I grasped it in my hands, pointing the barrel straight at her head. Yet I couldn't do it. She was too special, too important to my life to pull the trigger. I didn't even shoot as her piercing scream reverberated through the house. She was going to attract the others, and I needed to get out of there fast. I grabbed one of the bags with our supplies, heading toward the front door and swinging it open. What I saw on the road made me almost crap myself. Over 30 infected people sprinting to the house. I closed and locked the door, and dodged out of the way as V tried to attack me, face planting into the door. With the basement door still locked and nowhere else to go, I leapt up the stairs to at a time to end up on the second floor. I went through the hallway into the only room with an open door, the upstairs bathroom. I heard V bounding through the hall behind me. I slammed the door shut as I entered, turning the lock as a loud thump sound came from the other side of the door. I've been here ever since. There are no windows in here so I can't tell if it's light or dark out. The only source of time I have is by my phone, and even that's about to die. I don't have many supplies in the bag that I have. I have food and drinks that will probably only last me for a week. The gun that I brought only has one bullet, and I didn't bring any chargers for my phone. After it dies, all my hope dies with it. V's scream did what I thought it would. Attract the others. I can hear them climb at the door every second. Slowly, getting closer and closer to me. I covered the floor in a thin layer of water which won't help in the long run. One will end up dying and then the others will just climb over its corpse to get to me. The horrible thought entered my mind that, since I hadn't been bitten by the nightman, I could end it all using the gun and I wouldn't become one of them. I really just don't want to be a crazed zombie. In the over 24 hours that I've been locked in the bathroom, I've had time to think. I reflected on everything that has happened to me in the past couple weeks and how some of it doesn't match up. How could a company, let alone a small one, launch three undetected rockets? How could the Nightmen still live after coming into this universe, since they're supposedly made from undiscovered elements that shouldn't make up life? How would the CIA have so much control over the situation about Thera? I had no idea. I was starting to think those CIA guys weren't really CIA at all. Maybe it was just a cover story. I don't know. Maybe Mike was just a plant this whole time. I didn't know that either. I really hoped Mike and Lenny were okay. I hoped they weren't getting hurt by whatever messed up company was truly responsible for this whole situation. And I hope that, against every statistic that could be made out of the situation, I might have even the smallest chance of making it out alive. Yet, with every scratch at the door, that hope dwindled. The nightmen are going to get through the door any minute now. With my last few moments alive, I hope that no one has to go through what I've gone through these past few weeks. I know that no one will come looking for me and that I'm completely alone, and will be in my last seconds. The only thing that scares me right now is the fact that there might not be anything in the other side, and how I'll just be dead with no happy ending. I wish you all the best of luck, and now you can tell people about the hidden ninth planet they don't want you to know about. 
Thera, the interdimensional counter-Earth. I may not know what's on the other side, but I do know that in these moments, I've never felt more content, as if death will precede an eternity of happiness. Good luck to you all. Never forget my story. Thank you all very much for listening today. And as always, I want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Best Fiends. Head on over to the App Store or Google Play to pick up the mobile game sensation with 100 million downloads. In sponsoring today's episode, they've ensured our show is free for all listeners, and I highly appreciate their support. And as always, stay creepy.